Well, howdy y'all, and welcome to Old Hillbilly Horror Podcast. Growing up in the woods was something different. Let's get this straight, I'm just an average person growing up in the woods. Well, not average, but I am normal to a certain extent. I live out in the wilderness in a large forest reserve in the United States. I've lived with my grandparents with most of my life. I've never really known my parents before this, but nevertheless, to a certain degree, it doesn't matter. I live in the middle of the wilderness up here. Nowadays, my grandparents will be here for a day or two, then leave for a day or two. The length and time they stay and go varies, but in the summertime, I only have a handful of friends that are even remotely able to come hang out with me. I live in a very remote area of the place where I live and all you can see from where I am is mountains and trees. The closest town is around four miles away, and all it really is is a small shopping center with a general store and such, but that's about it. Some gas, some food, nothing special. Oftentimes I get the cabin to myself. It's not exactly an old wooden cabin if you're thinking about it. It's actually very nice. It has four bedrooms and three bathrooms. It's practically a lodge, but all it's missing is a garage. Our cars park in a sort of tent thing. It's just a bunch of wooden poles holding up a sheet metal roof. Because of this, during the winter, We'll often be stuck inside our little cabin for days, weeks, and every once in a while months. I've learned to go hunting, melt ice into water, and basically become self-sufficient from my grandfather. Going to school in this part of the country is kind of like it's optional. For the sake of keeping us secure, I'll use different names for my friends in future stories, so don't try and come find us. The woods are a strange place, it's like they're their own giant, sentient being. My friends Thomas and James would occasionally head down to a nearby creek a few miles from my house. It was a large creek, almost a river, but it was nothing we couldn't handle. Oftentimes during the summer we'd go out for hours without our cell phones and go explore. We all had cell phones, but there's practically no reception out there unless you're directly inside one of the houses, so most of the time they were just useless. Thomas and James were my best friends ever since I could practically think. We all lived within a six-mile radius, a tiny distance considering the size of most of the town. Thomas lived closer to me, so he'd often come over if I was stuck at home. More often than not, we'd sit down in the lounge room and just watch old movies that my grandparents had. Our cabin had a large glass window across the front wall, so you could always see into the distant wilderness. One time, a few years back, Thomas, my friend David and Jasmine were over. It was raining and my grandparents were out for a few days. David and I became close since he moved in that year. I had only recently gotten my license, so it was a dream. It was storming outside, so I just planned to let David and the others stay the night. It was dark out already, maybe around 10 when the four of us were sitting upstairs in the lounge room watching Stand By Me one of mine and Thomas's favorite movies. We were watching it when we heard a large clanging nearby the garage area. Originally, I shrugged it off as wind blowing over the trash cans or raccoons tipping them over until I heard the crash of metal against the building. Despite the rain outside, I knew the wind outside wasn't nearly that powerful to lift the trash can up to smash it into the cabin. I got up and managed to convince Thomas to come with me as I walked towards the outside. Before I went downstairs, I entered my grandparents' room and took the shotgun just in case it was a bear or something. Thomas took the fire poker and walked behind me, scared as a bat when I came to the front door. I looked outside and saw nothing yet. I counted to three before I opened the door to go outside. This wasn't the first time I had to deal with a bear digging through my trash. F bears and shit. Anyway, Thomas and I go outside and scope outside the area. The rain was lighter than I thought it was as the pitch black sky caked the entire yard in darkness. Thomas and I move forward towards the trash can. I know you're not supposed to keep your finger on the trigger, but I'm that moment all I could think about is getting that bear away from me. I hated bears ever since I was young. They scared the shit out of me, but I never felt this fear before. 
I turned the corner with Thomas and found one of the trash cans lying on the ground. I sighed in relief as Thomas looked shocked, looking past the trash. I noticed this so I asked him what was up. What are you looking at? Don't you see it? See what? The big mother F. Thomas pointed forward at a figure behind the tree line. I squinted to see it clearly and made out the figure of a bony, fur-covered being. I looked over at Thomas, telling him it was just a bear and to come on and go. Thomas looked in shock as he pointed forward. Why is it looking at us like that? I glanced back, being met with yellow, glowing eyes from the darkness. I took the shotgun and ran with Thomas back to the house. Before I ran inside, I tripped and shot my gun. It was one of those times where if Thomas wasn't there, I wouldn't be here today. Thomas stopped to pull me up as this weird, distorted roar came from the woods. We didn't have to exchange words to understand it was coming towards us. I left the shotgun and ran inside. Thomas and I slammed the door shut, hell out of breath as we heard the creature walking around. Thomas told me to go upstairs, get the others and barricade ourselves in my bedroom. I nodded and quietly went upstairs, doing just that. Thomas met me there shortly after, holding his spare hunting rifle he always brought with him when he came over. We all spent the night in the same bedroom, guarding each other as we heard the thing walking around the cabin over and over again. I fell asleep sometime during the night and woke up the next morning. Going out to the lounge area felt like it was freezing, every window was open. Nothing was stolen, surprisingly, but there was definitely someone or something inside of here. Thomas and I went outside that morning and found my grandparents' shotgun sitting on the front stoop, the barrel bent to an impossible angle. I had no excuse for that when my grandparents came home. Oftentimes during the school year, after school our school had a small skiing program where around 40 to 50 kids all got together on a bus or two to go skiing after school. Doing this was one of the few fun options we got to do for extracurricular around here. Our high school was small, maybe only 300 kids total. I know small town. We only had one elementary school and one middle high school, where grades 6 through 12 all went to the same school. Often enough, my friends and I would do this during the winter to give us something to do. We took a bus around 30 miles to a nearby campus with a large skiing hill in the area. The town was an entire campus town. Everyone was connected to the college in some way around there. Often James and I along with some of our friends determining the circumstances would all go skiing together. The mountain wasn't all too big, but the trails were certainly long. Each run would take 10 to 15 minutes to reach the bottom. On this particular occasion I was with my friend James. Not a lot of my friends liked skiing, so often enough it was just James and I. It was a few years ago when we decided to go with the bus after school. After a relatively short ride we got off the bus and got our equipment on. We skied for a couple hours with little event. It was just beginning to get dark when James revealed he had a little bit of dope on him. In my high school years we were what you would call the stoners. James would always get weird shipments, usually just weed, but it would get us off our ass. James pulled me aside and told me he wanted to smoke a joint or two and asked me to come with him. Me, being a teenager that wanted to get high as well, agreed to come with. We skied off the path a little ways until we were in a place where we thought we wouldn't be noticed. It was slightly past the ski mountain border so we knew no one would come looking for us. James took out the wrapping paper and rolled us both a joint. We made sure we weren't going to be seen so we took off our skis and sat under a little overhang of leaves and logs that we made the previous winter. We began talking about what teenagers talk about, girls, video games, our home life, all that shit. As it got darker James pulled out some candles and lit them, getting us a little bit of light to wrap more weed. After a while we decided that we'd finish up the last joint and head back since it would be around an hour when the bus left back to the school. James and I began packing up when an odd noise came from the woods. It didn't sound like from an animal or anything but more robotic, like a broken drill on a low battery. James caught on quicker than I did, alerting me to the noise. 
If we were sober, we would have most likely hightailed it out of there as soon as we heard it. But like down high teenagers, I thought it would be a good idea to go find the noise. James agreed to come with me as we had already packed up what we had and set it on the path. James and I both took a candle, walking off towards the noise. The closer we got, the more prominent the noise became, although never growing louder. We walked further into the woods maybe 50 feet when we realized we must have passed it as the noise became more soft. We began searching around for the noise using our candlelight. Back then we never brought our phones on such journeys, we always just brought our watches and wallets to go explore. James walked close towards this evergreen tree as suddenly the snow below it suddenly fell. James fell into a tree well as I heard him yelp in surprise. I ran over and looked down and I shit you not there was just a square hole. It must have been a trap door as I looked closer, seeing the reflective patch on James's jacket. I called out to James to see if he was alright. James replied for me to come down there. I know, straight out of a horror movie, but in our messed up minds we thought, oh cool, a trap door in the woods. I obviously obliged, sliding down into the slot in the floor. It was around the size of a kitchen sink, so it was a tight squeeze in. I dropped down with my candle as the room seemed to light up more. It looked like a bunker as all the shelves and such were entirely devoid of anything. That's when I heard James call me over towards a small steel door along the side. James had a concerned look on his face as I walked over, peering through the window. I was met with only a partially lit room with a single candle sitting inside. It looked like a meat locker room with several rotting animal corpses hanging on meat hooks. I'm so glad the door was shut cause I could only imagine the smell. By then I was sobering up a bit more and realized how messed up this was. I called over to James that we should leave when I hear the familiar buzzing again. I look over and see James rushing back towards the hatch, climbing out as fast as he can. Seeing James react like that is rare. Usually he was the calmest person in the group. So seeing him run, so afraid, I chased after him, scrambling after him. The two of us ran towards our skiing equipment up on the ridge where James was hastily putting on his skis. I asked him what happened that spooked him like that. What James told me shook me up. You know how there was that whirring sound coming from there? Yeah. Well, I saw what was making the noise, it was a camera. Oh shit. That's not it. Then what? It was a motion camera, something was down there with us. That sentence still resonates in my mind. We weren't the only ones down there, and I'm so glad I didn't find out what was down there with us. I know it's not the scariest story out there, but it's something that stuck out to me. Maybe I'll even go back if I can get over the fear of it. It was a couple years ago anyway, and the ski hill has since shut down that section of the mountain due to unsafe hazards. A year ago, it could be a good bonding exercise for James and I to explore since after James got into urban exploring despite the terror he felt there. This next story came from my grandfather when I was just a little boy. My grandpa is usually a very reserved man, but occasionally when he has a few drinks down the hatch, he'll open the hatch a little bit for me to peer inside. This story happened one fall evening when I was little. I'll tell this story from his perspective so it's easier on the writing. I shit you not we weren't expecting to find anything out in there. Even though I know there's weird shit going on around here, I know it's unlikely to run into that stuff. I went out for a hike that day at noon. It was the type of fall where everything was beginning to turn red and yellow, but still warm during the day. God, it was a nice day. I went down the hiking path alone as I did every year. It was maybe a three-hour trail, so I brought everything I needed. Some snacks, a compass, water, my Walkman, and my walking stick. I went down the path with relatively no incident until I was maybe three-fourths of the way down. Most years I'd see the occasional deer or fox or such, but this time was different. It felt as if everything in the woods had cleared out. Not even a bird chirping or crickets just the occasional breeze from the trees. I was down a particularly steep part of the trail, heading down through the trees and winding the path, a little when I looked over and saw this bone pyramid. 
I shit you not, it looked like someone had spent hours making sure it all stuck. On top was most likely a moose skull, but it was odd. All I can remember was the antlers were just weird, bent in an odd shape, and the skull was just built wrong. It was too long and slender to be a normal moose. I saw this and began to move quicker. There was no debris or anything on the thing, so I knew whoever or whatever did this was nearby. I moved quicker, not rushing, but I was unsettled nevertheless. Now before I go any further, let me just say my family is a firm believer in the creatures of the night, like Bigfoot, the Wendigo, Chupacabras. Now that that's out of the way, let me continue. I believe what I found was some sort of ritualistic belonging in the woods. As I continued on, I began hearing this sort of clicking sound like someone clapping two sticks together. The more I walked towards the car, the more prominent it became. I started to get freaked out, and by now I didn't keep my headphones in just in case I was being followed by something. The more I came down the path, the louder the clicking became when I saw the opening of the woods into the parking lot. I rushed over, glad to be near the safety of my car. I rushed out and threw my stuff in the car, never looking back as the clicking remained from the tree line. When I started my car, I looked up and saw this odd-looking silhouette of a man, but its figure was just wrong. It was lumpy, with a large pot of flesh on its arm from what I could see. The more I looked closer, the more fleshy it became. It didn't have eyes, I can remember that. I don't remember how long I stared at it, but it was probably only a few seconds before the shock wore off. I threw my car into drive when I saw its jaw unhinge. It reminded me of an ant eating something, or like a predator mouth from that one movie as it made the same clicking sound I heard earlier. Before I could think my foot hit the gas and I was on my way home. I know it isn't the most dramatic ending, but it was something that made me realize that the woods aren't always a wonderful, safe place, and it's the reason why I never travel alone. I'm happy to share more stories if people are still interested. I know it's a lot to ask for, but I'm happy that by telling people some of these stories people are interested in this topic, I'll tune in later and see if I should tell more stories. If anyone has any questions about these things, I'll be happy to answer your questions. During one summer I got my first job at a nearby Dairy Queen in town. I met a couple of my friends from there, especially this one girl from Amber. Amber was the type of girl that never really grew out of her horse girl phase, but instead adapted to the outdoorsy lifestyle. I was 16 at the time and she was 20. She told me how she came from South Dakota and wanted to live out in the country and discovered our small town and loved it. She went to the college campus nearby, a few towns over in Amber, and I became great friends despite the age difference. During one winter Amber decided to let me stay the night out at her dorm. My grandparents were in Missouri at this time, so it was easy to stay. And before you think what you're usually going to think, she had a boyfriend and I was interested in another girl from my school. I was lying on Amber's bed, watching her play on her Xbox when Amber's roommate, Kaitlin, came into the room. Kaitlin immediately asked if she could take her to McDonald's since by now the buses around town had shut down and since she didn't have a car. After some negotiations, Amber finally agreed, and I hopped down to go join them. We drove down into town at that time, it was around 2 in the morning. I'm not gonna lie, I was on some stuff when we went out, so before we pulled into the parking lot in McDonald's, I got out my eye drops and let them go inside before me. I hung back as the two entered McDonald's. We would have gone into the drive through during this time. The building was undergoing reconstruction, so the drive through area was closed. I finished up the eye drops and got out of the car when suddenly I blinked and I was back in the dorm. I'm looking down, watching Amber playing Halo on her Xbox when I was filled with shock. I tried to chalk it up to me being tired and imagining things when all of a sudden Kaitlyn walked in again. The entire ordeal played out again, Kaitlyn nagging Amber to go to McDonald's which went on for a minute before Amber agreed. Amber then walked up to me and asked if I wanted to come with her. Me, being weirded out of my mind, said no. I don't know what happened, maybe it was a brain F up or something, and this isn't particularly scary, but it's definitely something that has messed with my head. Another story I have is from my cousin that lives in Maine. 
Every once in a while, either my grandparents would go visit my aunt and uncle in Maine with my cousin Mike. Mike was a few years older than I was and grew up also in a remote town up in northern Maine. This story is from when my cousin graduated high school, and for his vacation before starting college, he decided to go on the 100-mile hike with his girlfriend Sam and his friend Aaron with his girlfriend Piper. The four were all outdoorsy people where they all agreed to pack their gear and head out. They packed two weeks' worth of supplies in their backpack, had a friend drive them to the head of the trail and drop them off. The first few days in the woods were relatively uneventful, although having encounters with a fox on their second night. On the fifth day, Piper begins telling the group that she's been hearing footsteps walking around the campsite during the night when everyone was asleep. She assumed it was one of us until we told her in the morning we had all slept through the night. We originally played it off as a raccoon or bear or something when we found a human footprint in the mud. Or at least that's what they thought. A bit uneasy, the four of them quickly packed up and headed off. Another night went by uneventfully. On the seventh night, when they were just getting ready to stop walking and set up camp, Mike saw a weird creature lying on the ground. The body was half decomposed with maggots squirming around it. Its skull and part of its chest was exposed. Its skull was almost like an elephant skull if you've ever seen one. Elephant skulls have a large hole in the center to make it look like a cyclops when all the flesh is eaten away. Mike tried to write it off as a moose with the facial deformity when Aaron noticed that all the legs were missing except one, which had almost like a human foot. Upon further inspection, it looked as though a large human foot had been burned on as a replacement for a hoof or whatever was originally there. The group decides to head a little further during the darkness and to not talk about it for the rest of the trip to not scare them. By now Sam was shaking in fear and wanted to leave right away. Mike and the others set up camp a few miles away on a ridge overlooking a relatively small lake surrounded by wilderness. Sam and Piper were having trouble sleeping so Mike and Aaron took shifts staying up to watch the campsite and keep the campfire lit while they slept, which seemed to ease them. Around what most likely was 3-4 in the morning Aaron was on watch when he hears a twig snap in the woods. Aaron looks up and sees this huge humanoid figure just standing in a nearby clearing, maybe 200 feet away. Aaron woke Mike up to look at the creature, and as soon as Mike wakes up the yellow eyes appear on the creature and darts off back into the woods. Mike and Aaron stayed up until the sun rose, hearing weird grunting sounds coming from the woods every couple of minutes or so. Aaron is convinced that it's Bigfoot while Mike believes it's someone messing with them. But it wouldn't make sense, they're still around 30 miles from the end of the journey, and it wouldn't make sense for someone to just wait out there just to F with someone. The moment the sun rose the group packed up, Mike and Aaron both agreed to not say anything to not scare the girls. The next night was relatively uneventful as they all decided that they would finish the trail by the next day. That morning they wake up to find that the same dead animal carcass they had seen days prior had been laying on the path forward where the end of the trail would be. The group, understandably freaked the F out, decide to jog most of the way back. After walking a while, the group is tired and Piper says she's going to go take a leak further in the woods. The group gets out some food for lunch when Piper comes rushing back. She has a shocked expression on her face. We ask her what's wrong when she explains for us to come see with ourselves. Our stuff is all out, so we decide to leave our stuff behind to go look. Stupid, I know. But they head off just over a small ridge and find this deer carcass literally turned inside out. It literally looked as if someone took a small slit into the deer and used an ungodly force to flip the deer inside out, to have all the organs spill out like a meat slushy. Sam immediately throws up from the smell as the rest of the group look in shock. The group immediately heads back to find in the minute or two they were gone their stuff had been raided through. Mike decided that this was enough and that they were getting out of there tonight. Mike packed up what was left since a lot of their food was gone and got the group to head on forward. The group reached the end of the trail when a forest ranger immediately greeted them. The forest ranger said that the trail was closed for the time being since they had found some hazards. The group went home as Aaron did some research, 
Apparently a dead body was found in a creek a few miles. Let's just say that most of the others aren't that big of long distance camping anymore. Aaron recently tried looking up the original news report though, but was unable to find the article. Sometimes things are covered up because if people knew that shit, I don't think anyone would ever do another journey like that. Growing up in a small town is a strange ordeal. Everyone seems to know each other very well, and the only new people we get are people on long road trips or family coming to visit us. Like I said, I live in a very small town, yet I love it. Towards the west end of town, we have some farms growing. Although most are cattle farms, there are the occasional place where they grow corn, wheat, whatever they can really. There's this old farmhouse that had been abandoned since the 1970s after a supposed murder that happened there. Although it's most likely that the family moved out, and that's what rumors spread. Anyway, when I was little, my cousin Mike and a few of my friends would come over, and we'd hop on our bikes. I remember this was a special occasion since Mike was there. This is the reason we went over there. Mike was the leader of our small gang when he was around and everybody listened no question. We went down the dirt path and Mike stopped the bike. It was around noon when Mike spotted the farmhouse, and I swear to God I can still remember the smug look growing across his face as an idea popped into his head. Mike told us that we were playing hide and seek in the house, since we didn't have much of anything else to do. James and I reluctantly agreed. We were around 8-9 at the time, so we didn't have any judgment against adventure quite at that age. The drew straws and eventually, I was the one that originally had to seek. I sighed and began to count to 90 as I knew they both ran to the farmhouse. 90 seconds passed as I opened my eyes. I smiled as I saw the door wide open to the farmhouse. Those idiots had forgotten to shut it. I thought to myself as I jogged towards the house. I reached the front stoop, heading inside. I remember the boards were so old, I thought every step I took the floor would collapse. I headed inside, seeing the house on the inside. To the right was a staircase while to the left lead to a living room. Straight ahead lead to a hallway to the kitchen then towards the back door. I smirked, knowing Mike and James enough to know they'd hide together in the same place. I looked forward as a creak came from down the hallway. I saw the basement door slowly moving in the wind. I smirked, knowing that they were leaving breadcrumbs for me to find. The basement was dark. I didn't even try searching for a light since I knew it definitely wouldn't have any power. Downstairs I heard a dripping sound. It was like a sink had been left on slightly as the water slowly drained out. I stopped at the bottom of the stairs, holding my breath, listening for any breathing. It was dark, I could barely see five feet in front of me, and the only light down there came from the upstairs. The concrete basement was cold, in fact. The entire basement was entirely cold from what I remember. I began feeling a large anxiety from the basement that I couldn't explain. I listened in and heard a soft breathing noise. By then I knew someone had been hiding down there and I was going to find them. I called out to them, telling them I knew they were there and I was going to find them. I started walking towards the breathing, avoiding anything lying around in the basement. I bumped into a piano and accidentally set off a few keys, which scared the shit out of me. Keep this in mind because this will come up later. I reached the back wall, the breathing having gotten louder. I moved to my right, hearing the breathing louder. The breathing felt warmer as I got closer. I reached out to touch them, calling out to the person when the breathing just suddenly stopped. I didn't hear movement or anything, but I continued moving. I reached the end of the wall, finding nothing. I felt odd when suddenly the piano began playing softly. At first I thought it was just in my head, my mind playing tricks on me. I focused in as the music began playing more violently. By now I knew that this wasn't normal and I began moving back towards the stairs in a panic when the breathing returned, a hot breath on the back of my neck. I screamed as a hand gripped my shoulder, squeezing it softly as I ran. The hand let go as I heard a large crash behind me, like a moose slamming through objects to get to a destination. My legs felt like jello and my eyes began to water as I climbed up the stairs and burst outside. I laid on the ground, sobbing as Mike and James walked over, asking where I had been. 
I was confused. I was downstairs for only around five minutes, but they told me I had been missing for four hours. I was confused when they told me they had been looking for me for three hours, but never checked the basement. When I asked why they told me that the door had been locked from the inside, and when they asked if anyone was in there, all that returned was silence. These are just some stories that are from my childhood and such. These were originally three different posts, but they were deleted. I'll be happy to tell more stories if people are interested. In July 1976, my wife and two children ages 12 and 7, and I moved across the Oregon Cascade mountain range from Corvallis, Oregon to Sisters, Oregon. At the time, Sisters was a small mountain range. I was so naive as to forest management, I didn't know there were designated areas to get firewood. During a Saturday in late October, we were running low on kindling, so we decided to go south as Sisters about 12 miles alongside the road where there was a large growth of two to three inch diameter trees with many blowdowns on the ground. We figured they would be easy to collect and sew up and load into our vehicle trunks. The morning was chilly high 20s, low 30s, so about 8 a.m. we bundled the kids and ourselves and headed out in our two-car caravan. Arriving at our spot, we pulled off the road and got busy. The only tool I had was a small bow saw. While my family gathered the poles, I began sawing. We quickly loaded my wife's trunk, and she took the kids and headed back to town. Once they were gone, I started sawing wood to load in my car. But after a couple of minutes, every hair in my neck, arms, and spine stood up I could. I felt I was in danger and that I should leave. There was no mind speak, just an intense feeling that I was in danger and needed to leave. I also knew something had eyes on me. I immediately stood up as my gaze was drawn to a downed tree about 40 feet away. It had snapped about four feet off the ground and been there a while as weeds and branches were obscuring any sight underneath the tree. I studied that tree briefly looking for something out of place, but I saw nothing and then slowly did a full 180 turn looking for any sign of any indication of an animal in the vicinity. I saw nothing. I later learned I should have looked up into the trees, but it never occurred to me then I tried to forgive myself for an overactive imagination. So I knelt back down and I got back to work. Almost immediately the hair again stood up and those feelings and thoughts came back. So I repeated the slow turn looking for signs something was out of place, nothing again. I studied the down tree to see if I could see anything behind it. There was nothing there. I brushed it off as imagination. I said out loud to myself, if anyone or anything else is there, then all right, I got the message. I'm leaving. It took me two trips to get all the wood and my saw to the car. Once loaded, I went to the driver's side door took one last look around, started the car, and left. I never saw, heard, or smelled anything unusual or out of place. The following Monday, when I went to get the kids from the babysitter, I must have said something to her. Her husband is part of Native American, and at the time was a heavy equipment operator for the Forest Service. Three days later, when I went to collect the kids, Bill was home. I'll call him Bill, it's not his real name. He was known for being a straight shooter. I stopped at the picnic table and said hi, and he said to get some iced tea or coffee and come back to talk to him. When I returned, he immediately asked me to tell him what happened the Saturday before. As I told him, he asked if I knew what it was that bothered me. I told him I didn't know. I figured it must probably it was a cougar, a bobcat, or a bear. He smiled. He asked, did you check the trees above you? I shook my head no. You should have. Then Bill said something about on an apex predator giving a warning before attacking. I thought for a minute and replied, So what do you think it was then? He asked. Could it have been a Bigfoot? I thought he was joking, so I laughed and said something to effect that I believe they could be real, but that they were probably myths or folk tales. For the next hour plus, he related his personal experiences with the people of the forest. Here is one of his stories. Bill was on a job site in Washington State using a D8 cat. He was on the side of the mountain when he stopped for lunch. Where he stopped, there was a 600 to 700 foot cliff drop off on his right. 
He sat on the edge of the cat with his legs dangling over the track to eat and enjoy the scenery of the valley below. As he took a bite of his second sandwich, he heard a faint noise behind him, but on the other side of the cat. He turned to look, and to his surprise his face was about 18 inches away from a huge sabe that was leaning on the track looking at him with a faint smile on its face. He said he knew he was in no danger, and he felt no fear. For some reason that morning he had asked the place he was staying at to pack an extra sandwich for his lunch. He slowly reached into his lunchbox, grabbed the sandwich, unwrapped it, and held it out to his new friend. The sabe took it, ate it in one bite, pushed off the track, gave a slight grunt, and turned and walked up into the woods, giving him one last look. After hearing all his encounters, I left their house that night a firm believer in the forest people. I was on my golf cart by myself, and it was completely dark outside and quiet. I live in a neighborhood surrounded by farmland in rural Michigan, and woods throughout various spots. I was driving but pulled over because this giant beetle was on my shirt. It pinched me and freaked me out. I pulled over next to a stretch of woods and struggled to get it off of me. In the woods nearby I heard walking, like perhaps a deer walking around, so I wasn't scared. Yet the sounds got louder and closer. The walking had gotten so loud it sounded unreal, something out of Jurassic Park like a dinosaur stomping. The walking had gotten overwhelmingly loud and extremely close, so I slammed on the gas and hurry out of there. I looked behind me but couldn't see anything, but felt shivers down my spine because I swear it was inches behind me. Not sure if this has anything to do with it, but I was talking about skinwalkers with my sister and doing some research, so I hope that didn't invite anything. But I can't even describe how loud the stomping was. It sounded unreal and was seriously terrifying. I wasn't too sure what it could have been, but many people are saying it was probably a wendigo, and I do believe this is, they can get up to 15 feet tall, which would explain why the stomping was very loud perhaps. Good evening, fellow enthusiasts. Let me start by validating my credibility first. I've been monitoring the crypt side for a good 15 years now, have a degree in zoology, and a master's focusing specifically on herpetology study of reptiles and amphibians for the newcomer. This academic background has greatly contributed to my pursuit of the known and the unknown. What I'm about to share is a living testament to my adventures in the dark corners of our world. And before I roll the dice on this, know that this is not some drunken tall tale. During the event, I was unadulteratedly sober, senses sharpened by the austere seaside chill. Yesterday, I had a harrowing encounter, the likes of which I've never encountered in my generous stretch of experiences facing the elusive nag's head beach creature. The moon was in complete authority, stars stubbornly shrouded behind the thick shroud of clouds. As the tide surreptitiously slid in, I saw, or rather sensed something, a mere flicker at the corner of my vision, something that required peripheral acknowledgement. A fleeting shadow, a passing chill, an abrupt indent in reality. This being the nag's head beach creature, much like many obscure curiosities we study, appreciates the solitude of night. Nocturnal engagements are its preferred encounters, lingering in the periphery, solidifying its ghostly essence. A mystery etched in the sands of nag's head, always visible from the sides, yet vanishing to thin air the moment direct contact is attempted. Illusory, you might say, but not when you've heard it the sound that threads chills through your spine. The creature in its movements spoke a peculiar language, an alien-like slithering rustle, a chicka chicka, if you will. An uncanny sound clawing up your consciousness, it was akin to the whispers of nighttime wind through desolate dunes, or the uneasy scuttle of a crustacean against washed-up seashells, a serpentine orchestra only the nocturne listens to. Now about its tracking signature footprints you wouldn't expect. They were digital, formed of an enigmatic static that pulsed before disappearing into the soothing waves. Ghostly lit specters on the sand left behind by its passing, as if the beach obliquely hummed with the static discharge of this creature. 
a modern mystery misaligned from anything we perceive as typical. And God forbid, should you strive to photograph this elusive entity, for it would defy the said attempt in an uncannily digital way again, rendering itself only a three-pixel smudge in any photo. An undefined form, yet mysteriously defined by its defiant resistance to be perceived. After the encounter, my mind whirled with theories and speculations this creature's nature, its ethereal presence, and its disembodied essence felt otherworldly. Pondering my experience, the possible explanation that eventually crystallized was dubiously paranormal. I believe that what I encountered was not a creature bound to the three dimensions we live in. It might be our first contact with a creature of the fourth dimension. The digital footprints, the confounding three-pixel apparition, and the ephemeral perceptibility all lead to an elusive creature that exists in a higher order of spatial existence, only partially interfacing with our three-dimensional space-time reality, a being transparent to us, living a parallel life wrapped in the splintering silence of the nag's head night. This is our world, the crypt side. A melting pot of varied realities, countless oddities, and incomprehensible encounters. This was my encounter with the elusive Nag's head beach creature, an experience that tipped my skeptically academic life to a pondering, fear-churning paranoia. But isn't that why we're here? To chase the unknown and expose the veiled truths? Because in the end, isn't that the very soul of cryptozoology? Stay curious, stay brave, and keep your mind open. I was a part of Navy SEAL team for as long as I remember. Still, when it comes to my crazy missions, I have one to share. So the mission had taken us deep into the hostile territory, where danger lurked in every shadow. Our objective was clear. Rescue a kidnapped scientist from an abandoned facility with a grim history. Little did we know, the labyrinthine corridors of this place held not only human threats, but a supernatural presence eager to ensnare us in its dark clutches. As we navigated through the decrepit halls, the air thick with tension, the stench of abandonment clung to every corner. Our footsteps echoed through the desolate facility, a haunting symphony of our uncertainty. The scientist's life depended on our success, but something far more sinister awaited us in the depths. It was in the bowels of this forsaken facility that we encountered the unknown predator. About seven feet tall, its muscular frame and large head with long, wild hair gave it an otherworldly appearance. Yellow eyes, almost glowing in the dark, stared at us with an unsettling curiosity. It stood there, unmoving, as if assessing us. We cautiously continued our mission, keeping a watchful eye on the mysterious creature. It didn't seem aggressive, but an eerie tension hung in the air. Then, without warning, it attacked. The battle erupted in chaos, the creature moving with an uncanny speed and strength. Its sharp teeth flashed in the dim light as it lunged at us, catching us off guard. Our training kicked in, and we fought fiercely for our lives against this supernatural adversary. Bullets pierced the air, and the creature's roars echoed through the labyrinth. It was a battle of survival against both the paranormal and the physical, each member of the team pushing themselves to the limits. In the end, we managed to overcome the creature, but the victory was short-lived. As we called for extraction, our relief turned to dread. Through the facility's shattered windows, we saw an approaching enemy army, their silhouettes dark against the moonlit horizon. There was no time to celebrate our triumph over the thing. A greater threat loomed. Swiftly, we made the decision to retreat, leaving the haunted facility behind. We slipped away into the night, shadows merging with shadows, and the encounter with the unknown predator became a secret etched into the memories of the silent warriors. We never spoke of it again, and the story of that night remained buried in the classified pages of our missions, a chilling chapter in the unsung stories of the Navy SEALs. In late August, 1986 or possibly 87, I'm not sure which, I drove four friends up from Portland to the south side of Mount Hood to spend three days on the trail that goes round the mountain. We were all 17 or so, and there were two other couples and myself. 
On the second day, we had made it only to the east side of the mountain going clockwise. I think it was called Sherwood Camp. We found the campsite late and decided to set up on our own near a creek on the opposite side of the trail from the campground sign. A hundred yards or so off the trail in a fairly level open part of the forest. There was a creek nearby. There were huckleberries out and we set up our three tents close together. The next morning I got up about 5.30 but noticed from my tent flap the others had all slept in. Some movement about 70 feet away in the berry bushes and evergreens caught my eye. I saw a large light beige colored creature all covered with hair 7 to 8 feet tall. It's back to me, trying to reach something, a branch I guess, about 15 feet. Off the ground. Not more than 10 feet away was this other creature the same but small, all covered with hair except for the front of the hands, the bottoms of the feet and around the eyes. The second one was only about three feet high and was bending over picking up a stick which it was trying to put in its mouth. The little one was a bit darker in color, a dark beige. The hair on both was up to four inches long at most. The big one was really thick set. I could not make out any of the front of the hands, the bottoms of the feet and around the eyes. The second one was only about three feet high and was bending over picking up a stick which it was trying to put in its mouth. The little one was a bit darker in color, a dark beige. The hair on both was up to four inches long at most. The big one was really thick set. I could not make out any of the front of her because she was turned away from me almost the whole time about a minute. I thought she was the little one's mother. She gave a kind of grunt at the little one like she didn't want him doing that and he dropped the stick. At that moment I was on all fours leaning out of the tent, trying to see better and my hand popped on a twig, and the big one looked right at me. But all she did for a second was grunt again at the little one, and she reached down, stepped over and took his hand. It was like she was motioning for him to go with her, and looked in my direction one more time, grunted softly again, and they were gone behind the trees. Their faces were like an ape around the lips and jaws, you know, their jaws jutted out a bit. Their heads weren't pointed, but I could see by the bare patches around the eyes and skin on the hands their skin was a kind of brownish gray. My friends never saw anything, but after we hitchhiked back to the jeep and were on the way out, I slowed down for a ranger, and he stopped to make sure we were okay. He was an older guy, I didn't get his name, he had gray hair and a bit of a paunch. He was a nice guy, he said this was his first season doing this, and when I told him what I had seen his eyebrows kind of went up. I didn't report this to anybody else. When I asked for other details, Kay added, Well, when she walked away, she sort of waddled from side to side a bit. When I asked her about smell, she replied, Nothing that I could tell. Did you look for tracks? No, I was a little scared. We just all got up and packed up after breakfast, and I didn't even want to go over there. All in all, it was a kind of scary but really fascinating thing. The whole thing couldn't have taken more than a minute, a minute and a half at most, but it seemed like five. The details really stuck in my mind. K. Told me there had been no alcohol or drugs and was sure of what she had seen. She said her friends died some time after that in a car crash, but that that ranger might remember. Around a week and a half ago, I was in Ocean City, New Jersey, and it was around midnight. I decided to take a stroll to the beach to enjoy a cigar and relax. As I gazed out over the ocean, I noticed something unusual 14 bright objects that looked like stars. These objects were perfectly round and resembled any other star you'd see in the night sky. However, they were all flying and dancing around each other in a mesmerizing display. Some of them flickered, while most emitted a steady bright light. These objects flew in curves and circles, and at one point, they all converged closely before suddenly dispersing in all directions. I looked around hoping to find someone to ask about these mysterious objects, but there wasn't a single soul in sight. I stood there for over ten minutes, captivated by the silent performance in the sky. Their flight patterns resembled how gnats or bugs move, with no discernible order or pattern. 
These objects weren't like any known aircraft, not helicopters, airplanes, satellites, meteors, or comets. One of them caught my attention when it flew towards the horizon, turned around, and rapidly approached me. It passed right by, flying westward over the beach, the ocean city strip, and finally disappeared into the bay far out to the west. The speed and maneuverability of these objects left me in awe. I contemplated going back to my house to fetch my phone and return to the beach to capture this extraordinary sight, but I feared they might be gone by then. The round trip would have taken too long, and I didn't want to miss anything. The next day, curious to see if anyone else had witnessed the same thing, I searched on YouTube and looked for articles about Ocean City UFO, but to my surprise there was nothing. No videos, no articles, it seemed like nobody else had seen what I had experienced. This is the first time I've shared this encounter. While I hesitate to claim that these objects were aliens, they were undoubtedly UFOs to me simply unidentified flying objects, as I couldn't determine their origin or nature. It remains a mystery, and I still have no idea what they were. It was the strangest and most awe-inspiring sight I've ever witnessed in my life. At the age of 11, my family moved to a large two-story house that overlooked some foothills about 30 miles west of Mount Rainier. Around 2011, I started seeing strange things there. In one instance, I was watching late-night TV with my mom and had my attention caught by what looked like a really bright star in the east by the mountain. I stared at it for about three minutes before the star suddenly dropped straight down into the foothills. I stood up and shouted, scaring my mom. She didn't believe me, but I know what I saw. The second most bizarre occurrences happened after my girlfriend at the time moved in with my family. On three separate occasions, my girlfriend and I were startled by incredibly bright flashes of light in the dead of night that illuminated every corner of whatever room we were in at the time. Almost like a camera flash or a lightning strike. The only thing is, we were on the second floor of the house every time, and there were no trees or roofing near any of the windows that would have allowed someone to take a photo without a ladder. But there was nothing when I'd rush over to the windows. They also only happened on hot summer nights where there wasn't a single cloud in the sky, which rules out the possibility of lightning. We both saw the flashes every time and could never rationalize what they could have been. I do some solo rock climbing on Yosemite big walls from time to time. It's not free solo the ropeless slip and dive version, as I'm still roped in and have various safety systems in place, but it's still damned unsettling to be on cliffs alone. Last fall I solid a 1E300 feet route on the Washington column called the Prow. It took me three days. The first night was horrific because a severe thunderstorm rolled in. I spent the entire night shivering wide awake 500 feet off the ground as the heavens were rent asunder all around my portal edge. That was downright terrifying especially considering that I was a bit of a lightning rod with all of my aluminum equipment. After I descended two days later, some hikers I bumped into mentioned that they had seen lightning strike the top of the Washington column that night. But the most eerie thing I've ever experienced was the whiteout. Between the thunderstorms and pouring rain on the first and second days, the fog would roll in and start to thicken. At its worst, visibility dropped to 15 feet. On the ground that qualifies as more than creepy, 500 feet up a vertical granite face and totally alone, it is disorienting and nightmarish. I could see 15 feet up, left and right, before the rest of the granite faded into the fog. But the worst was looking down into a white abyss. Not seeing another human for three days was weird, but not seeing the ground for several hours scared the bloody shit out of me. Your world condenses to a tiny bubble, and there is nothing to orient you in space but gravity. The closest thing I could compare it to is closing your eyes and floating underwater. It's that level of sensory deprivation, but with the horrifying knowledge that you are utterly alone and isolated, I had similarly terrifying experience the previous year on a solo ascent of the West Face route on Yosemite's Leaning Tower. 
It's a 900 feet route that consistently overhangs 10, 15 degrees. On the second day, I was behind schedule and was finishing the last bit of climbing in the dark. The very last thing I had to do was ascend a fixed rope attached to my camp about a 100 feet above me. Ascending the rope involves using clamps that cinch on the rope and allow me to pull myself up the rope only, without needing to use the rock face itself. However, the rope hung vertically, and with the overhang of the face, I was about 20-25 feet from the cliff. I had my headlamp on and made the mistake of looking down to see. Nothing. Not a damn thing. There was just a black pit below me, as I was too high for my headlamp to illuminate the ground. It was like seeing the blackness of space, except beneath you and with no stars. Just like the whiteout on the Washington column, not being able to see ground is a really disconcerting and disorienting feeling. I noped the F out of there pretty quickly and spent a fairly pleasant night 50 feet from the summit before descending the next day. I was in Alaska studying dormant volcanoes as a field geologist, and most of these trips consisted of 30-day solo excursions with a sample drop-off every week or two depending on how remote the survey is. I'll never forget on my 26th day, hundreds of miles from any sign of man, and as I descended the mount walking maybe a mile off was a man, so naturally I gave the universal greeting of holding my whiskey flask into the air as high as I could hoping he would see the sun glimmer coming from it. And indeed he did. My solidarity had probably gotten the best of me considering I hadn't spoken to anyone else for weeks, and I probably shouldn't have approached him, but I was so lonely. He raised his rifle as we got closer, and made me dump my rucksack before he lowered it. From the contents that poured out it appeared he was interested in trade. I followed him back to his camp, which later I realized was his home. It was a shanty wooden hut in the middle of the woods. I realized he had been there for years. He had a rain barrel and no electricity, with multiple animal hides drying out in the sun. He descended upon my whiskey stash, and soon I had given him all my salt, pepper, Tabasco, and just about any other flavoring I had brought with me. He was fascinated by a small solar panel I used to charge my GPS and phone. He had been in the wilderness so long that the panel only became commonplace after he went off the grid. He had never heard what 9-11 was. Halfway through our meeting, I realized he had a motive behind speaking to me. He had seen me gathering samples the days before and was worried my company was in the exploration phase of mining. I explained to him that wasn't the case and I was representative from the government verifying the volcanoes were classified as dormant correctly. Immediately his demeanor changed and he grabbed his nearest rifle forcing me to leave because I said I work with the government. In hindsight, I should have understood a man like this had very little care for government. He walked me a few miles away and told me never to come back and tell my boss the same. I promptly moved on to a new section of my map and marked are the features in the area around his hut as classified correctly. When I was about 12 or 13 my mom, two sisters, brother and I were driving home from a nearby very small town at about 2 a.m., a commute that we often made to see family who lived there. The drive to and from was only about two to three hours depending on traffic, However, since it is desert landscape with nothing but flat cracking sand and a few scattered succulent plants, it could often feel much longer. Because it was dark, we didn't even have that to look at. We resorted to playing different road trip games to pass the time we were all too young at the time to have any entertaining technology and to keep my mom awake as she had trouble driving at night. After driving for roughly an hour and a half, we crested over a hill where we could see the next larger city in the distance, the city's lights making the overhead clouds glow, and the moon sitting low in the horizon to the right where the clouds tapered off a bit. At this point we were all completely engulfed in our game, until suddenly an insanely bright and basically blinding green flash lit the horizon, looking like it burned hot white towards the middle. When I say green, though I don't mean a green like normal green, I mean a weird, almost toxic and yellowish looking color, but still astonishingly bright. 
It lit the horizon from end to end as far as we could see, and then disappeared as if being sucked away just as swiftly as it appeared, like when someone covers a light source with their hand. At the same time it disappeared, every single light in the city we could see in the distance shut off at once, like a snap of someone's fingers. This scared me because I had seen power outages and usually they go grid by grid, not all suddenly together. The weirder thing was that the headlights to the car turned off as well, but not the car itself. My mom pretended not to freak out for the sake of us, but as the oldest I could tell she was genuinely scared. We kept driving for maybe a minute and a half before everything just popped back on again like someone plugged everything back in again, not grid by grid like I'm used to. I researched later the next day to see what it could be and saw the green flash phenomenon, but saw that that usually only occurs at sunset. Also tried to see if it could be some sort of power plant thing, but it wasn't that either. Still don't know what it was or what could have caused it as we were nowhere near a military base or testing ranges of any sort. I used to live in a quiet, remote village nestled among the picturesque landscapes of Sweden, about 40 kilometers northwest of Kirping. It was the kind of place where everyone knew each other, and life moved at a pace that was more attuned to the rhythm of nature than the hustle and bustle of city life. Our village consisted of no more than 10 houses, creating a close-knit community where everyone looked out for one another. One summer day when I was around eight years old, the sun was shining brightly in the sky, casting a warm glow over the lush countryside. I was out biking with a couple of my adventurous friends, eager to explore the outskirts of our village. Our destination was the old, abandoned train station that stood as a relic of times gone by. It had an air of mystery around it, a place where imagination could run wild with tales of the past. As we pedaled closer to the train station, the sense of curiosity mixed with a hint of trepidation. We were about 40 meters away when something caught my attention, a glimpse through a second floor window. There, standing in stark contrast to the surrounding decay and desolation, was a black figure. It felt as if its eyes were piercing through the distance, fixing directly on me. I couldn't help but gasp and point, my voice tinged with a mix of astonishment and unease. Look, do you see that? I asked my friends, my voice quivering slightly. They turned their gazes toward the window, their eyes widening in pure terror. Their silence spoke volumes, and I could tell they had seen it too. The figure stood there, shrouded in darkness, an enigma against the fading light of day. We didn't exchange any words, but the unspoken understanding hung heavily in the air we needed to get out of there and fast. Adrenaline surged through our veins as we abandoned our bikes and ran, our hearts pounding in our chests. Fear lent wings to our feet, and we didn't stop until we were back in the heart of the village, panting and trembling. It was a feeling I will never forget the primal fear that had gripped us, the sensation that we had encountered something beyond our understanding. We gathered in hushed whispers, recounting what we had seen and experienced, our young minds struggling to process the inexplicable. Over the years, the memory of that encounter never faded. Doubts crept and had it been a trick of the imagination, a result of our youthful curiosity running wild. But as I grew older, my conviction remained steadfast. To this day, I firmly believe that what I saw in that second floor window was real, a glimpse into a realm beyond our comprehension. Perhaps it was the spirit of a long lost soul, lingering in the shadows of that abandoned train station, or maybe it was something else entirely. Whatever it was, that moment ignited a fascination with the unknown, a curiosity about the mysteries that lie beneath the surface of our world. The small village and that abandoned train station hold a special place in my heart, forever linked to that summer day when innocence collided with the inexplicable. And while time may have passed and life may have taken me on different paths, the memory of that black figure remains etched in my mind, a reminder that the world is full of wonders some visible, some hidden, and some that only a few are fortunate enough to glimpse. My dad and I went on a hunting trip in upstate New York, where it's common to see a bear or two. 
We visited a reserve, explored lakes and outposts, and overall, it was fun. However, while in one of the towers, we spotted a furry thing about 200 yards away in the trees and bushes. Hunters aren't allowed to shoot off the outpost, so we didn't think much of it at the time. Later, when we set up camp, we heard footsteps around the tent. I didn't pay much attention, assuming it was a deer or a squirrel, and went back to sleep. But it started getting weirder, with heavier and faster circling footsteps. I woke my dad, and we both went outside in our boxers with our guns. However, we couldn't see anything, and the noise stopped. Thinking I was going mental, I apologized to my dad, and we went back to bed. The next day, as we continued our journey, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I felt unsettled, but my dad didn't notice anything off. We set up camp again and saw the hairy thing once more. We watched it for a while until it disappeared, and we went to bed. But an hour or two later, we heard something different heavier, faster footsteps that sounded like multiple beings. Panic set in, and I woke my dad up. We both grabbed our guns and my dad went outside, shining his flashlight and yelling to scare off whatever was there. I was terrified and had tears in my eyes. We decided to leave immediately, packed up the tent, and started our hike back to the truck. During the hike, we heard knocking sounds all around us, making us even more anxious. We half jogged towards the truck, but my dad couldn't run due to a knee injury. At this point, I was on high alert, ready for anything with my gun in hand, fueled by adrenaline. As soon as we saw the truck, a blood-curdling scream pierced the air, making us run even faster. We drove to the nearest ranger outpost and reported the incident. The rangers mentioned similar reports, and my dad briefly described what he saw a seven, eight feet tall creature with a human face and a hairy body. He said there were four of them, but he doesn't like to talk about it often. Sorry for the long story. We were in Wales in 1992 for training exercises that we were to spend the night in the woods on the outskirts of a small town, then head into town for some R&R. As usual, we were eating field rations and had just broken out onto our sleeping bags for the night, and we heard something large moving throughout the woods. A few of the guys from my platoon grabbed their rifles and went to investigate. A minute or two later, the most awful sound I'd ever heard came from the woods. It sounded like somebody trying to scream while being strangled, maybe 50 yards away at most. It wasn't human nor animal in nature, but it was loud. To this day, I struggle to find the words to describe it. It shook me up. A few minutes later, the guys came back from checking out the woods. They did not have a clue what it was. One guy swore he saw something weird but he was also pretty shaken up too. We just need to forget about it, and I said, we can't just forget about it. I don't know what it was, but there's a chance it was a person. We need to go make sure. The guy who looked just seemed shaken and pale told me, it was no person, I'm telling you. Whoever it was, they're long gone by now. Well, I'm not just gonna sit here and do nothing, I told them. If you guys are too scared to go back there, then I'll go check it out. At this, a few of the guys who had gone into the woods shook their heads, but most of them just stared at the ground. I'm gonna go back there, I told them. So one of my friends who was with me in the platoon told me he would come with me, even though he did have a lack of enthusiasm. The rest of the platoon was less reluctant, and so we all headed back there, minus a few guys, of course. We were not successful. Nothing was found, but we felt like we weren't alone out there in the wilderness. Anyway, that's my story. Haven't experienced anything else in the military quite like it. My husband, myself, and our 11-month-old baby were spending the weekend at the Oregon coast. We stayed one night and on the second day decided to just watch the sunset and head back home to Hood River after we ate dinner. It was pretty late by the time we reached Multnomah Falls exit, and my husband needed to take a break from driving to get some fresh air. We pulled into the parking lot, and there were no other cars at all. We parked our vehicle at the west end of the lower parking lot. 
Our baby was sleeping in the back seat, and he and I got out of the vehicle to stretch our legs and get some air. It was a pleasantly warm evening and very clear out. Just a few minutes had passed when all of a sudden we heard noise coming from the east end of the lot. We both looked and saw a very large, tall creature coming out of the tunnel where during the day people are walking in and out of constantly. It had to duck down to come through and seemed a bit irritated to have to do so. It came out of the tunnel and stood up tall pivoting to the west and headed our direction. During this entire ordeal, my husband now acts and I never spoke a word. Our voices fell silent as we both watched this thing head our way. As it came closer my mind tried to decide what it was. It clearly was not a human too tall to be that. It was not a bear as its arms were long and actually hung to around its knees at a full stand. It was not a gorilla as it walked like a human and was too big to be a gorilla. Process of elimination led me to the only logical conclusion. It was Bigfoot. Without a doubt. It was dead silent. You could have heard a pin drop. Wouldn't rational people jump into their vehicle where their precious child was sleeping and take the hell off? Well, to this day, I can't explain the fact that we both seemed frozen on our feet and could not move or speak. At this time, I recall there was no fear. Absolutely none. Anyway, it approached, and as it walked by us about 20 feet from where we stood, it stopped for just a moment, analyzed us by turning its head to look and made a sound, and a slightly irritated wave of its right arm. It then quickly lost interest and continued on its way heading west in the parking lot. We watched in silence as this huge and obviously dark and hairy creature walked up to a cement wall, firmly planted its hands on the wall and oh so quickly swept its feet and legs right on through as it vanished into the dense forest beyond. Then it was gone. This entire incident lasted only minutes I am sure, but living it seemed to be in slow motion. Once the creature hopped the wall my husband and I finally looked at each other wide-eyed. All that he said at that moment was, let's get the hell out of here, as we got into our vehicle and took off. It wasn't until this moment that I felt physical fear. I began to tremble uncontrollably. My heart was racing at what we had just witnessed. We drove still in silence for a few minutes, and then it seemed that we both at the same moment said to each other, did you see what I just saw? It was as if we had to confirm it with the other because it was so unbelievable. Yes, we had indeed both seen the same thing, thank God. No one would believe this story. He believed me, and I believed him. He also told me that he had no fear until it was gone, just like me. Not once did we feel threatened by it, though it seemed a bit irritated by something or did we fear for our sleeping baby in the back seat. Figure that one out. That's my story. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for giving me a chance to share it. When I was attending a university about seven years ago, I found myself in a situation that would forever change how I conducted myself outdoors. When classes got out one January afternoon, the county I was in was hit with an intense blizzard. While it was pretty typical to get snowstorms every week in the winter months in that area, this one lasted a good few days, and we got so much snow that the school gave everyone a heads up that classes would be canceled on Monday and Tuesday at least due to predictions of the storm lasting clear until Sunday night. My roommates and I decided we would get our homework done early so that we could spend the weekend exploring some of the thick woods surrounding the campus. Why would 320-somethings be exploring the woods in three feet of snow, let alone howling winds and freezing temperatures? Well, even I think this sounds ridiculous, looking back on it as in grown men. You see, my college was known for its various arts programs that produced a number of gifted writers, painters, and actors. Over the years, many students fabricated stories and false accounts of various bizarre happenings in those woods, ranging from Bigfoot sightings to ghosts and coven activities. We thought the snow would make for an interesting investigatory experience, so to speak. I figured that if there was indeed some supernatural phenomena going on in the woods, we would see things like disturbances in the snow and the natural silence of almost no one being outside in the winter terrain. 
meant that we would hear all sorts of strange noises with no commotion to obscure them. I was generally the reasoner of my group, so no one argued with me. We packed some basic supplies into one of my hiking packs and left just a few minutes shy of noon. Long story short, we accessed the woods from a little-known entrance about 50 meters from the parking lot behind the Liberal Arts Lecture Building and hiked about two kilometers into the woods. The scenery was stunningly gorgeous, with the evergreen pines and invasive maple trees saturated with white dusting and snow covering every inch of the forest floor, sometimes high enough to completely conceal the underlying shrubbery. Despite this, the area was rather unspectacular, with only the odd squirrel hopping about and complete silence. Eventually, we decided to hike down to a shallow stream that students referred to as Flinger Creek, so nicknamed for the many students and local residents who would fly fish for brook trout in it during the spring months. There were lots of large rocks along the bank, so we thought we would, you know, roll a couple Northwest Delights and chill there for a bit. Well, we spread an old sheet full of holes and awkward stains on the ground and took our seats, joking about our butts being soaked with freezing snow water and even colder stones digging into our nethers as we tried to keep our hands from trembling as we rolled our smokes. Suddenly, a dense fog consumed the ravine, and it became hard to see anything further than around a dozen meters from either direction of our blanket. While this happened quite fast, it wasn't exactly unusual to us. After all, we were next to a river, with snow piling up above the embankments, so it only made sense that we would get some fog. After a few remarks, we brushed it off and began to toke up. Afterwards, the fog seemed even thicker than before, and as it was nearing three o'clock in the afternoon by this point, we decided to head back before the sun would begin to set thus, dropping the temperature and running the risk of our soaking pants freezing to our junk. We balled up the sheet, put it back in the backpack, and began to head back. Well, we got lost. We used a fallen tree as a trail marker on the way down to the river, but we actually walked past a tree that happened to have also fallen a few dozen strides from the one we noted. In the spring, this would not have been a big deal, but given the sheer amount of snow everywhere, combined with the fog, we could not really tell which way we were headed. My friends started to bicker amongst themselves, while I attempted to get us out of there. Eventually, I decided I needed a cigarette to relax and regain focus, especially given that it was now nearly four o'clock and the sun was beginning to set. I stepped under a tree and, upon sparking my zippo, I noticed that the tree I was under had a bunch of weird hieroglyphs and runes carved into its bark. A lot of times, students would do this to trick hikers into thinking they were near some witch or ancient monster in order to scare them for fun. I didn't really pay much mind to this, until I heard some footsteps picking up from all around the tree. I called out, Go F yourself, thinking it was one of my friends trying to scare me. I'm a pretty jumpy guy, honestly. At once, they all called out in protest. They, in fact, seemed to be under a tree several paces in front of me, where they remained since I broke away to smoke. I felt a chill not from the cold weather before replying, I heard someone stepping around. Was probably a deer or something. They made a joke about Bambi stalking me and laughed before they fell silent with an eerie promptness. I'm almost done with this guy, I called out, motioning to crush the cigarette, but in the snow, before I was halted by one of my friends via a quite drawn out, SHH. Wait. I got that same chill again. I remained faithful, quietly standing there as if waiting for the infantryman to give the signal to push on. I then heard another step. This time, it was a little heavier, like a foot intentionally pushing all the way through the snow to meet the frozen ground underneath. A moment later, I heard the sound of rapid footsteps go straight past me, picking up in speed as they grew audibly fainter. Jeremy screamed an obscenity I can't quite recall as the other guys shuffled in the snow suddenly, as if they were startled. Bear in mind, I could not see them from where I was. But I sprinted ahead whether in diligence or stupidity. I cannot remember until I tripped over one of them, who was on all fours struggling to get up. What on earth? I shouted as my comrades shuffled around and got their bearings. I could now see them clearly, 
and I almost laughed at the sight of powder snow all over their bodies, looking as if they got 86 from a trashy club in. 1986. They were all fumbling their words, which didn't seem to improve, even as all of us returned to upright positions. Then, Ron, arguably the most confident and bravest of us, straightened his glasses, sighed, and spoke. I don't know what it was, but something big walked right in your direction. Well, what did it look like? I muttered. Hell if I know. I could barely see the spark of your cancer stick in this fog. All I could tell was that it was dark colored, almost like a shadow, and that it was taller than us. He waved his hand frantically over his head as if to remind me that he was indeed the tallest of us, and he was at least six feet and was moving your way. It was nuts. I immediately approached this from my usual philosophical perspective. It was probably a moose. We're not supposed to get them this early in the year down here, but hey, my uncle told me about a grizzly bear on his property last summer, and he lives supposedly 200 miles away from grizzly territory. Everyone groaned and sighed in silent agreement that this was probably some big animal, startled by our sudden screaming. At any rate, it was long gone, and we decided to use a compass app on my Android to get to some road that we could then follow back to campus. After about a half hour of walking in the opposite direction, we wound up just to the left of where we entered the woods. We shouted in celebration before heading back to our dorm. Later that night, just shy of midnight, I stepped out of the residence hall to have another smoke. My joints were a little stiff, so I decided to take a stroll. Like an unsung hero revisiting an old battleground, I walked back to the trailhead we took earlier, looking down it as the shadowy path now looked to be the throat of some great animal, descending into nothingness as in an almost graceful void. I sighed and turned around to head back. My heart skipped a beat and I was speechless. I could not move or scream, only inhale sharply as I witnessed the most terrifying thing I had ever seen. Towering in front of me at least ten feet tall was a being as dark as oil, with a long and twisting neck, extending upward and then curling back down in a supernatural arc, cradling a small, oblong skull with a wide, gaping mouth, bearing a bottom row of flat teeth and a strange, bony appendage just below what appeared to be a blunted nose pushed into its face, and two beady yet bright silver eyes spaced far apart and sitting on either side of that skull. I could make out no further features of this thing only that, right in the center of its awful, somewhat feathery torso which seemed surreal and featureless, it held a head bearing a stark resemblance to mine close to its chest if it had one. My eyes slowly rolled up to meet this thing's before I fell to the ground, laughing maniacally as snow swirled around us. So me and my friend you'll name them Red went down to a bridge that was over a river. The area was pretty shaded and trees was covering the bridge. Red and I were hanging out there and we heard a noise. At first we didn't think anything of it. Then we heard another noise and Red started running. I followed them. While we were running I heard rustling to my left and something told me to run faster. So when I ran faster Red looked behind me and they saw a 6FT guy with no face standing behind me. It was in the shade he was wearing a white sweater with blue jeans. Anyway, we got to my ATV, and we turned around and saw it walking the opposite way. It wasn't walking normal, it was walking like an NPC. It turned the corner on the bridge and disappeared. We got super scared and I tried to start the ATV, but it somehow got stuck in the gravel. It was so stuck we had to have help by a random stranger. We eventually got home, but later we decided to go to a cemetery at night. The cemetery wasn't even a mile away from the bridge. I had another friend come over all named them Blue, and we drove over to the cemetery. Once we pulled into the cemetery, everything was just gray, and the sun had just barely went down. I saw some cloud of smoke right across from me and I had the urge to go further into the cemetery. All of the sudden I just pressed the gas W my hand. And when I drove past the cemetery I felt this feeling of determination, and I had this thought that wasn't mine, and it was, I have to save them. And I stopped at a corner and I looked to my left and I saw a cloud of dark smoke, 
and I remember having this thought that wasn't mine, and it was, it's hunting us. After that my head went back and my body was shaking and gagging. Then I just suddenly pressed on the gas with my hand and I flew around the corner. My hand was stuck and I couldn't move it from the position of being on the gas button. I pulled over and showed my friends my hand. I could barely pull it away and it was shaking, it hurt a lot. So I said, someone take over I can't drive anymore, and I got up to switch with red. But my body was thrown down and I passed the gas button to drive. Blue was praying while we were at the cemetery and they got punched in the gut and they felt like throwing up. So they were leaned over while I was driving home, and Red had a clear shot of me. Mind you, they let go of the ATV and pulled their knife out. Eventually we got home and Red was acting strange. So we went to my basement and me and Blue started to sage Red. But they didn't like it. Also Red was staring at me and smiling the entire time. So I saw them reach into their pocket and then they stood up. I looked away for a second and their knife was halfway open and they were staring at me. So I immediately took their knife away and I was smoke cleansing Red and saying, whatever has attached to Red's body will be gone. And I was whispering barley audible words. I opened my eyes and Red started chuckling at me. It didn't sound like their normal laugh so I got my friend and we put a blessing on her to get that out of her. And we both still feel called to go back to the place. What do we do? A few friends and I went on an overnight hike in the Rockies behind our little town. A few years back when I was in HS, our camping site was pretty far up there and it was getting dark. The spot we were at was nestled in a grove of trees secluded from the wind and elements, so we decided to stop there for the night. The four of us built a little fire and ate dinner, then just talked for a few hours. Then all of the sudden my friend leaps forward and douses the fire with our emergency water plunging us into complete darkness. Needless to say the rest of us were pretty pissed, as there was no reason for him to do this. He quickly shushes us, and we realize he is absolutely terrified. Like so scared he couldn't even speak or move. The rest of us manage to get a few word out of him, and he tells us to look up on the ridge where we should have been camping at. It was pretty far up so it was kind of hard to see at first, but that sight will haunt me for the rest of my life. There was a fire, a big one, like a bonfire sort of thing. Around the fire were several figures moving in a slow circle. They were humanoid but not quite, and in they had arms and legs like people, but something just seemed different about them that I can't really explain. Almost like the limbs were too long and skinny or something, but maybe not. Anyway, these figures just moved around the fire in a really slow circle over and over again. My one friend claims he could hear them singing something, but I don't remember anything. Importantly, there was one standing off to the side a little ways leaning with his arm on a tree branch above his head. It really creeped us out, but we were able to sleep it off. We figured it was a scout troop having a camp or something. Morning came and we finished off our hike to the peak and on our way down we passed the place we saw the figures and decided to check out the camp. It was completely deserted. It was obvious that there had been a fire and there were footprints everywhere. Inside the fire pit was a small mound of charred animal bones, probably chipmunk, and a pile of four or five rodent skulls that had been burned. Creepy, right? Then we look over at where the one figure was standing. Blood. Not a lot, but enough to be of concern or anything, but enough to be creepy. Then we see the tree branch he was casually leaning against. It was well over any of our heads, and I'm over six foot. That would mean that in order for the figure to lean against it like he was, he would need to be at least seven feet tall. Needless to say, we got off that mountain very fast, and I have never been up there again. We called the fish and wildlife rangers and told them what we saw. They said it was probably just a bunch of kids messing around and not to worry about it. It might have been just that, and we let our imaginations run wild, but all four of us swear to this day we all saw the same thing, and it didn't look like a bunch of kids in the dark. I don't believe in ghosts or the supernatural, but those mountains still scare the shit out of me, and I will never go back there again.
During the summer of 2013, I stayed at my parents' house in rural Illinois with my little sister while they were out of town. She was in my mid-teens at the time and I was early 20s. We are both very interested in the paranormal and have discussed what else could be out there. This particular night, we were sitting in the dark in the living room. I turned all the lights off and we watched the lightning bugs outside the large windows, just casually talking. Out of nowhere, there was an unbelievably huge burst of orange light from outside. It lit up the entire downstairs as if I had turned the lights on. I'm talking about a nuclear explosion bright. My immediate response was thinking that our house, or the neighbor's house we were facing, had caught on fire. We both ran out the side door, and that was it. We both have zero memory of what was outside, how long we were there, or what we did after returning in. We simply woke up the next morning in our beds, and oddly, it took us both a few days to remember anything had happened. It wasn't too long after this that my sister started having a memory or a vision of us walking out the side door like we did that night and seeing a large green orb at eye level in the middle of the driveway. That was it. That's all that happened, but it still bothers me today. We both found it especially odd because we had such a fascination with the idea of otherworldly life. If something happened to us, we would discuss it. We also don't understand how we could have seen that amount of light in the living room. We walked outside and then casually returned inside with no explanation for what had happened, only to not remember it until days later. If we were both sound of mind, it wouldn't have occurred like that. About a year after this happened, I decided to read the book Communion for the first time and came across one of the author's first experiences of being abducted. He recalled waking up to a huge orange glow coming through every window and being absolutely positive the house was on fire. I put down the book at that point and still haven't finished it because of the extreme unease it gave me. I recall my exact same reaction. I now believe that we were both abducted. I wonder if either of us will eventually recall more of the incident. That is what I fear most. We were stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. This was back in 1990. I was still a newbie on my first deployment. I had been in the Army for 11 months and was still considered in the training phase of my military occupation specialty. I was 19, and there were six other guys out with me on a mission, and I was the designated driver. This was a training mission from hell. We were on a recon mission for some reason or another and we were out of sight of earshot on the countryside. As we were, you get used to seeing wildlife skitter past and hearing it as well. A deer would constantly amble across the roads, rabbits, raccoons, jackrabbits, and all sorts of birds would be seen very frequently. I was driving the lead vehicle, a two-man jeep with all sorts of radios. They were not much for comfort, but they sure got the job done. I drove us down a long stretch of road, and in my rearview mirror, I noticed something large and black run off to the left side of the road into the woods. Once we got past where it had vanished, I thought nothing of it other than that it must have been a deer or something. After all, it was the middle of the afternoon, and I had seen all sorts of wildlife out here before. It wasn't until the sun had started to set again that I now noticed it. I looked out to my right and saw a large black figure, maybe 500 feet away. It was shambling out of the woods and into a clearing. It was roughly man-sized, but it did not walk like a man. It walked slowly and awkwardly, almost as if it were hurt. It was hunched over, and the way it moved its arms, I couldn't quite see what its hands were like. All I could make out was that it was black, but had no discernible clothing or anything on it. It also appeared to be extremely muscular. I sat there in awe for a moment, pondering what it could be. I decided to pull over and find out. I stopped the jeep, turning off the engine. There were no other vehicles in sight, so I thought it was safe to get out. I pulled my rifle off my shoulder and slung it. I grabbed my field radio, switching it on. King to all of us, hey, is anyone else seeing this? I whispered. All the radios buzzed with static for a moment, and then one of my squad mates answered, yeah, I don't know, but you should see it too. 
I said as I walked around the jeep to get a better look. He told me he couldn't see it and said, What is it? Is it on the road? He had asked. No, it's in the clearing to my right. It's walking right there towards the tree line. I'm going to try and get closer, I said. Wait, they told me. I gave a few quick glances back and forth behind me, checking to make sure nobody else was there, and then I carefully crept towards the clearing. I finally got up to the tree line, looking through the trees. It was gone. My squad mate appeared over the radio. Hey, I can't see it. Where is it? I don't know, it was right here, I swear, I'd whispered back. That's not possible, I wouldn't have seen it. Well, I'm telling you it was here, I said, pulling my field radio off my belt and switching it back off. We sat there a few moments, waiting to see if it would reappear in the clearing. It did not. At this point, I was pretty freaked out and decided to head back to the jeep. I walked with my rifle at the low ready, pointed at the ground, but with my finger resting on the trigger. I didn't tell them that I was heading back yet. I wanted to see if it would reappear. I got back to the clearing and took a look around nothing. I turned and headed back to the jeep. I was walking away from it. Then a scream came out on the radio. My squad mate screamed. I shouted back. I heard him scream again. I shouted, what again? As loud as I could without attracting the attention from the other jeep. He did not answer. I asked, what was going on? So I ran back to the jeep and jumping in, I didn't see the radio man anymore. What's going on and where did everybody go? He had asked. Before I could answer, there was a crashing through the trees. We both jumped out of the jeep to see what it was. What we saw will haunt us for the rest of our lives. It was my squad mate. He was screaming, running straight toward us. He was bleeding from multiple gashes, and he had this black thing chasing him. Whatever the black thing was, it wasn't human. It was a mangled, twisted black figure moving like a man but not quite human. My buddy from the jeep and I stood there frozen in horror, watching our friend run towards us. We didn't know what to do. When my buddy saw that our friend was being chased by this thing, he turned and ran back. I just reacted, grabbed my rifle, pointed it directly at this being, I pulled the trigger, firing a spray of bullets on him. I don't know if it hit him or not, but he stopped, and when I stopped shooting, he then began to advance on me. I was about to take another burst at him when my friend jumped in the jeep and shouted for me to get in. I jumped in the jeep beside him after getting out to shoot at this thing, and he throws it into reverse and punches the gas. The tire spun, gravel flying everywhere as he tried to get us turned around for a quick exit. He finally got us pointed in the right direction, and we went flying back out the way we came. I looked behind us for any sign of that thing, but I couldn't see it anymore. As we drove on, I could hear my friend whimpering next to me. He had his hand pressed against the deep, oozing gash in his right arm. I reached into the first aid kit and pulled out a field dressing. Here, put this against the wound. He took it, pressed it against the injury, but not before I saw his fingers were raw and red. He had somehow gotten that gash without realizing it when he was running from the creature. We can now hear this thing chasing our jeep in the woods. It was paralleling us from inside the woods, but just outside of you. We could hear it crashing around. This wasn't possible. I had shot it several times, and it should have been heard badly enough to be able to not keep up with us. After a few more minutes, the crashing in the woods stopped, and my buddy grabbed my shoulder and said, Don't look back. So what do I do? I immediately turned around and looked back behind us. There were several of these beings running after us in the woods. I looked back at my buddy, and he was white as a ghost. I was trying to make out just how many there were, easily over four or five. And they shouted, What are they? I don't know, but we're not sticking around to find out, he nodded, and we kept going as fast as the jeep would allow us. The radio man is screaming, Guys, what is that? And we shouted, We don't know, guys, we heard the gunshots. What is going on out there? My buddy overcame his fear for a moment, trying to explain what he saw as best as he could. 
I looked back and saw that those things were now running through the woods beside us, keeping pace with our jeep. This was unreal. I don't know how long we drove, but eventually, the jeep stopped in front of a guard shack at the same kind of base. I couldn't make out the insignia in the dark, but it did not look like anything I'd ever seen before. We got out of the jeep and ran into the shack. The two guards manning the gate had their weapons pointed at us. What is the emergency? My buddy stumbled, trying to catch his breath, and explained. We... we were headed to the front gate, and... and there's a thing chasing us. We were still in training, and we ran into something in the woods. Please help us. This thing chased us all the way here. The guards looked at each other, and then the closest one to my friend pulled him over to a corner for a private conversation. I couldn't hear what was being said, but I could see my friend's face turn from fear to anger. The other guy approached me, I'm sorry son, we can't let you in. I was taken aback by his words, what? I just saw my friend get attacked and chased by something, and you're not going to let us in. The guard's voice is firm but calm. Truth is, you're not authorized to be here. I'm afraid we can't let you in. I was getting frustrated. Nobody comes into this space unauthorized. You have to understand that. Now please get back in your jeep. I was dumbfounded. What's going on here? This is part of our base. The guard spoke in a firm and resolute tone. I understand you're upset. Now please go. I looked back at my friend, who had a very defeated look on his face. I know it was pointless to argue, and we had gotten out of there quickly, doing our best to evade whatever chased us far into the woods. Everything had gone quiet, and we hadn't heard much of anything now. We eventually did make it back, and we were informed that what we had encountered was a part of our training mission. No further questions were allowed. The portion and part of our base that we tried to enter into did not allow trainees in, including us, which was a strict part of a military facility. Everything was coordinated for us to encounter these beings by the military as some sort of training operation. These are things I didn't learn until much later on. I went on to serve for a few more years and got out. I lost contact with all my buddies. had a truck pull into my deserted primitive camping area on National Forest land around 2 a.m. and stop right next to my tent. Now, in context, I was camping alone. This was a designated camping area, and I was the farthest back from the road, a good 200 feet. I had no fire going. Still visible from the road, though. Anyone just wanting to turn around could have done so right at the front. Around 2 a.m., this truck comes in, drives all the way back to my tent, and stops right next to it, just sitting there. I could tell the type of vehicle by the silhouette its headlights cast through my tent. There was absolutely no legitimate reason for anyone to do that. So I'm there in my small a-frame tent which I'd made the bad judgment of setting up with its door towards the road thus providing me no cover to exit. And all I can do is sit there in my tent with my AR-15 at the ready freezing my butt off in 39 degree weather because I had to crawl out of my sleeping bag and was just in my underwear. Knowing if they mean harm and there's more than one person, I'm almost certainly dead because I'm a sitting duck. Note, I had the AR-15 in the tent with me because it was bear country. Fortunately for me, they probably decided there wasn't anything worth stealing and left after a few minutes without getting out of their vehicle. All my valuable stuff was locked up in my SUV, and all I had visible was some cookware and a small camp stove. I learned a few things from that. One, get a bigger tent that I can more easily move around in and it's quicker to get out of, and two, always set your tent up with the door facing away from the road to provide some degree of concealment if you need to exit. Remember, folks, not all predators walk on four legs. Some walk on two. We live in New Brunswick, Canada. On July 22, 2023 in the early morning, we were awoken by our six-month-old daughter crying. We heard this on the baby monitor in our room. As usual, we got up to check on him, me to grab her and console her, my wife to prepare a bottle for her. 
I picked her up, and as I left the nursery, I looked down the stairs to my right, through the garage window. I saw a tall, thin, black entity. I know I saw it, and as I looked at it, it darted inhumanly fast out of sight. I walked to the room with our daughter, my wife had the bottle ready, and I tried to get the dog to leave the room with me. He was too scared to leave the room, which is unusual. I eventually coaxed him to follow me. As soon as we left the room, the dog tucked its tail between its legs and headed to the desk in the living room. It stayed under and trembled. I would dismiss this as my mind playing tricks on me. However, when I was 19 and I am 36 now, I had an experience with a tall, slender black being, which has haunted me ever since. I don't talk about it as people judge quickly and won't believe. I used to live and work in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan at Walmart. I also worked at a popular bar or restaurant. Needless to say, I worked a shift in the city until midnight at Walmart. The store was four city blocks from the residence where I was staying. If you have ever worked there, you punch your SIN number into a computer at the back of the store. This starts your shift. I punched out after the shift and walked home. It was dark in the city, but with the lights you could see very well. I walked south two blocks and then cut through the parking lot. When I reached the sidewalk again, I noticed an eerie lack of light, took two steps and heard a metallic sound. I looked around feeling strange and noticed the city lights were missing. I could not see the store. There was only blackness. Then I heard a metallic cling twice from behind me. I spun around quickly to see an alien gray in color with a triangular face and black eyes. I was not panicked and said hi. The alien quickly shot out of its arm and touched me with a finger on my chest. I was not scared at this point. As the finger touched me there was a strong electric charge I could feel. This charge paralyzed me and I felt forced fear. Every nerve ending in my body reverberated with this shock. The fear I experienced did not come from me but felt forced, and it was 1,000 times stiflerable than any I had ever endured. The fear was so intense that my heart pounded instantly. I had to focus quickly and steadily on slowing my pulse as I didn't think my heart could sustain my life otherwise. The next thing I knew I woke up on a metallic rectangular table with six, seven to eight foot tall thin black beings standing around me. And oh my God, one had its hand inside me. It felt like it tore me apart. The pain I remember and the forced fear are still there. I am paralyzed, trying desperately to move. The entity towering above me passed through my entire body. It felt like it tore me apart and put me back together, unimaginable pain. I blacked out. The next thing I know, I wake up. It's all black and I'm on a metallic floor. I hear clinging to the floor. I see four of these tall black entities. They kick me, hurting me more. I try to move, but I'm still paralyzed, fear running through every nerve ending in my body. I can't fight it. It's almost electrical. I feel like I'm going to die here. I don't want to die here. No, dear God, no. I grow angry as I get beat. I look in my mind and struggle with all I have trying to move to do anything. I force a little movement, I raise an arm, but my body is still isn't cooperating. It takes everything I have, but damn it, I'm dying here fighting. The rest of me cannot move as I swing, and I hit one of the entities, causing the fear to become even stronger, and the paralysis to become even worse. My body becomes limp, trapped in my body scared and unable to get up, I black out. The only thing I remember next is waking up in bed at home, trembling and convulsing uncontrollably, completely paralyzed and suffering the forced fear. I want to move, but I can't. The pain in my heart is unbearable. My heart beats like it's about to explode. My body feels like it's vibrating from my heart beating so fast. My focus is on preventing death with all I have. Slowing down my heart helps me calm it. I try to move but it feels like four hours. God only knows. I'm still paralyzed, still in that damned fear. Finally, I broke free. I walk upstairs. My mom looks shocked to see me, explaining to me I was absent for three days. Thought I was at a friend's. In my mind, I missed no time. I thought I had a nightmare. I told myself I had a dream. 
Not so lucky. I checked the computer at work and it showed I was there. No one at work recalls me being there. They told me I had missed my shift. I had no memory for three days, what has the power to do this? The only thing that proved I wasn't insane was the computer. My memory is absent for a day. I saw that damnable thing again tonight. I loaded the guns and waited for daylight. I last saw it when I was 19, and I am now 36 years old. My memories of it used to be so awful that I'd remember pieces over the years. I would wake up paralyzed in sweat and terrified. I fought the fear in my mind until I could remember and not enter into convulsions, still function and still move. I would have dismissed what I witnessed tonight, but I've seen it before. No one believes, no one cares. Not sure why they came back, but I felt I needed to write this. This incident involved my fiancé in April 2011. To this day, she refuses to talk about it, but I decided to post it here to see what others can get out of it. We then lived in Bangor, Maine. It was around 10.30 p.m. that evening. I was on a late shift at work, and she was home alone with our cat in our apartment. She said she read while the cat slept on her lap. A moment later, the cat stood up and stared intently at the outside door. He then mewled and scampered into the bedroom. He had never acted like that before, so she assumed it was just another weird thing cats do. Just as she got comfortable again, the doorbell rang. She thought it was strange that someone would want to visit at that time of night. She got up and peeked through the hole, but saw nothing. So she turned away from the door when there were three loud knocks. She was immediately alarmed, but curiosity took the best of her and she cracked the door to see who was there. She saw a boy around 11 or 12, though short, standing there. She opened the door to ask what he wanted. She assumed that this child had either gotten locked out of another apartment or asked for help. That's when he looked up at her and she noticed his eyes. The light from the apartment spilled out into the hallway, affirming his black eyes. She claimed she was paralyzed by shock as the child demanded entry. By that time, the cat had come out of the bedroom and lay on the floor behind her, ears folded back and hissing. She said she felt compelled to say yes, but as she stared into those coal black eyes, she suddenly slammed the door and locked the deadbolt. She claimed that she listened to the child's footsteps in the hallway, but heard nothing. After several terrifying minutes, she peeked out the door and the child was gone or disappeared. She said she had never been so scared in her life. She thought the cat's hissing interrupted her paralysis, allowing her to regain her thoughts and quickly close the door. She never discusses it, though I'm sure she wonders what may have happened if she had let the black-eyed boy into the apartment. On August 14, 1986, I went for a morning walk at Cape Blanco Beach like any other day. The cool ocean breeze brushed through my hair as I enjoyed the peacefulness of the early hours. Little did I know that this simple stroll would lead to a life-changing encounter. Approaching the north end of the beach, something unusual caught my eye. Two large sets of side-by-side -side tracks in the soft sand. They were massive, at least 18 inches long, unlike anything I had ever seen before. Excitement and curiosity rushed through me as I wondered if these could be the legendary Bigfoot tracks. Determined to uncover the truth, I followed the tracks as they led away from the shore and into the dense forest bordering the beach. The tall trees cast shadows and the rustling of leaves beneath my feet was the only sound. The fresh tracks confirmed I was on the trail of something extraordinary. Walking for two miles, my heart pounded with anticipation. The forest seemed to engulf me, creating an atmosphere of suspense and wonder. Despite the excitement, I couldn't shake a sense of unease, feeling like an intruder in this mysterious realm. Suddenly, the tracks vanished. There were no signs of where the creature might have gone. Disappointed yet determined, I searched the surrounding area for more clues, but found nothing. It was as if the creature had disappeared into thin air. Feeling watched, I continued my search driven by the desire to unravel the secrets hidden within the woods. 
Hours passed, and with the sun climbing higher in the sky, I reluctantly decided to turn back. Although I didn't find concrete evidence of Bigfoot's existence, the encounter left an indelible mark on my soul. This occurred in Oakland, California in November 2016 where my wife's parents live. There had been several shootings in the area more than normal and the funeral home on International BLVD had been getting a lot of business. My in-laws were driving through Oakland at around 2 a.m. in the morning. My mother-in-law worked as a live and hospice nurse and only had a day or so off. She was coming back at 2 a.m. after having the evening off. While they were driving to her job, they saw a beautiful young woman standing on the corner next to the funeral home who was very well dressed. They saw her at the corner while they were stopped at the intersection and noticed that the woman smiled and then waved at them. They also noticed that her eyes were totally black. My in-laws were frightened and drove away as fast as they could. My father-in-law drops off my mother-in-law at her work and wonders if that ghost woman he saw at the corner will be there on the way back he had to go through that same intersection. On his way back, she was still there at the corner, and this time he was stuck at the light at the intersection. She again waved to him, and he noticed again she had black eyes. It seemed like she was trying to get him to come over and pick her up. Naturally, when the light turned green, he sped out of that intersection to get home. No one seems to know who she is, but they all seem to agree that her funeral was probably through the funeral home there on that street. As to why she was on that street between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m., I think she was looking for victims. My older brother Mark disappeared when I was just seven. The last memory I have of him comes from a lazy Saturday afternoon in the summer of 2008. He was on our backyard porch with a bunch of his high school friends, eating ice cream cones and arguing about horror movies or something. I don't know. I never paid much attention to their conversations. But I do remember they were excited about going to their first, real party later that night. I came outside to give Mark a gift, a charm bracelet I'd made for him from a series of strung together Lego blocks. For good luck, I told him. Mark looked at the bracelet. I'd scrawled letters on it in Sharpie, one letter per block. Together they spelled out Mookie, my nickname for him since I was a toddler. Mark just laughed and pocketed the bracelet. Thanks Smelly Ellie, he said, tousling my curly hair. I remember yelling at him and growing red-faced. Then I ran back inside. Don't call me that, I yelled. Those were the last words I said to my brother. Mark and his friends were headed to the Swamp Soiree that night, a tradition at Bartram Forest High School. Each year, a group of popular seniors would throw a big end of the summer bash on the outskirts of the Okagobi Swamp, a massive wilderness area in North Florida, about an hour from our home in suburban Jacksonville. The soiree was basically a big kegger with a bonfire where everyone got drunk, smoked pot and hooked up in their cars, or if they were really wasted in the mud. The area was remote enough that no police ever came by and there were no locals to piss off. The party's exact location was kept secret, shared only to those fortunate enough to be invited. Swamp soirees were known for their lethal amounts of alcohol and drugs. The kids who threw them always came from wealthy families. They brought multiple kegs of Blue Moon or Stella, handles of top shelf liquor, bags of dank ass weed, and occasionally cocaine. Mark and his friends arrived early that night, before most others had shown up. According to his friends, some douchey baseball players pressured him into doing a 20-second keg stand. Shortly afterwards, Mark told his friends he was going to take a piss. He looked pale and sweaty, like he was going to throw up, his friend Eric told me years later. The last time anyone saw him, Mark was stumbling around in the darkened woods, headed deeper into the Okagobi Swamp. Two hours later, his friends drunkenly searched the same wilderness, calling out his name while sinking halfway into the mud. Two days later, my parents searched the area with local law enforcement. Two weeks later, a 400-person search and rescue operation combed the Okagobi Swamp, 
equipped with helicopters, John boats, and multiple foot teams. And two years later, the final official search ended, this time with cadaver dogs. No one ever found anything. It was like Mark had vanished from existence entirely. One moment there was a smart, sci-fi obsessed teenager who wanted to design robots that explored distant planets, get married and raise three, five kids while living in Miami. And the next moment, nothing. I never participated in an official search for my brother. I was too young. But years later, when I was in college at Florida State, I applied for a summer internship at the Okegobe National Park, in part to look for anything that might have been missed. I'd always been interested in the wilderness, even though my parents never let me go camping or hiking after what happened. They wouldn't even let me play in the woods of our backyard. But that only made me long for such places even more. Mark loved being outdoors. Being in the wild was one of the only ways to keep his spirit alive. One of my earliest memories was of us hiking together on the trails at Guana River State Park. We'd run out ahead of our parents, till it was just us in a wide green world full of sprawling oaks, wide marshes and endless mystery. As kids we fantasized about running away to live in the woods, like a modern day version of Swiss Family Robinson. We'd never have to go to school. We could stay up as late as we wanted. It would be total freedom. When I went in for my interview at the Okagobi Park headquarters, the head interp ranger George Craig saw my last name and raised his eyebrows. Ellie Brooks. I'm the little sister of Mark Brooks, I said, answering the question that was forming in his bald head. I helped lead the first search party for him, he explained. Really sad. I'm very sorry for your loss. Thanks. I told him I was using the internship as a way of coping with his loss. He hired me on the spot. The job was simple enough. Most of it consisted of manning the park museum or gift shop and talking to visitors. They would come in to browse the dioramas on swamp wildlife or peruse books on bird watching. The park received visitors from all over the country, but most were locals from the nearby town of Oconee Pop. 604. They were usually older folks who were retired, stopping by day after day just to talk. These locals had all sorts of crazy stories about the Okagobi Swamp. It turned out Oconee was known for two things. Its massive paper mill, which gives the area a noxious fart smell when the wind blows north to south. And its town mascot, the infamous Swamp Rex. Oconee sits along the eastern edge of the Okagobi Swamp. It's the only human civilization within 50 miles of the wilderness. As such, the town has experienced many unusual animal encounters over the years. Everyone who's ever owned a swimming pool there found a full-grown alligator floating in it at least once. Water moccasins sometimes coiled up on the town's roads to catch warmth in the winter. And locals love to say how the deer population vastly outnumbered the human one. But not all creatures could be explained. Since as far back as 1889, people in the area talked of an eight-foot-tall humanoid alligator that roamed the swamp at night, killing anyone who littered, polluted, or otherwise disrespected the natural ecosystem. They called it the Swamp Rex. Most reports stated the creature had glowing green eyes, a long, powerful tail that could break bone, and an elongated head full of spear-like crocodilian teeth. The Swamp Rex would hunt at night then returned to its mud hole somewhere deep inside the swamp where no one feared to tread. I first learned of the swamp wrecks from my older brother. As a child, Mark was fascinated with cryptozoology, the study of unverified creatures like Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. He used to tell me campfire stories about the wrecks when we were little, how it was millions of years old and would travel throughout the swamp via a series of underwater caves. The stories scared the bejesus out of me, but I loved every second of them. He told me once that he wanted to go on an expedition into the heart of the Okagobi to find the creature. I was the only other person who wanted to go with him. It sounded like the perfect adventure, like something out of my favorite movie, Jurassic Park. Mark and I never went on that expedition. He lost interest in stupid fake monsters by the time he was a senior in high school. 
I doubt the Rex was even on his mind when he attended the swamp soiree that fateful night. Mark never saw the swamp Rex, but many others have claimed to have seen it over the years. Even though the legend dated back to newspaper articles in the late 1800s, it didn't really become known until March 1989, when Oconee sugarcane farmer Bill Howard noticed a tall man wandering the edge of his property late one autumn evening. Howard lived on a remote farm on the outskirts of town, right next to the Okagobi Swamp. If it was a man, he'd have to walk miles through mighty thick woods to get to my backyard, Howard told reporters. Keeping his eyes on the figure, the farmer grabbed his 12-gauge shotgun and a camcorder he'd recently got for Christmas. I knew right away something wasn't right about it. It stood like a man, but it had this big tail and it moved with a kind of animal grace, he said. Instead of aiming his gun, Howard raised his camcorder and shot the first known footage of the swamp wrecks. The creature only appeared for five seconds on screen before fleeing deeper into the woods. It was somewhat hard to make out, given the footage was shot from a hundred yards away and during twilight. But even with a low-resolution 1980s-era camera, people could see the figure had a tail and an elongated head, just like the swamp wreck stories of old. Soon afterwards, Bill Howard's footage aired on the local news and gradually spread throughout the country via cryptozoological outlets like the Weekly World News and nascent internet forums on the paranormal. Eventually, the creature made its way into greater pop culture. In the 1990s, The X-Files aired a Monster of the Week episode loosely based on the Rex, and the History Channel did a special on it for its Monster Quest series in 2009. Over time, tourists started showing up in Oconee, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature themselves. Various gift shops opened, selling all kinds of Swamp Rex merchandise, from t-shirts to mugs to alligator hats, even Swamp Rex IPA beer. People came from all over the country. Most were skeptics just looking for another wacky Florida story to tell. But some were true believers. Many even believed the Rex was involved in real-life disappearances tied to the Okagobi area. Since 1980, over 50 people have gone missing in or around the swamp, including my older brother. The most famous case happened in the early 1990s when a wealthy land developer named Jerry Flagler vanished after witnesses last saw him in the Okagobi area with some business partners. He was going to illegally cut down them trees, Oconee's town historian Mary Madrigal told reporters. But the Rex took M before he could. Like Mark, the authorities never found Flagler's body. By 2019, when I was working at the Okagobi National Park, the swamp wrecks had become a vital part of Oconee lore. A cartoon version of it was even featured on the town sign. Though they didn't know my relation, many of the locals who visited the park would tell me stories about what really happened to Mark Brooks. Most of them believed the swamp wrecks took my brother because he was disrespecting the land by being at the swamp soiree. How come it didn't take anyone else then? I would ask innocently. There were at least a hundred other kids at the party on the night of Mark's disappearance. The locals usually didn't have an answer to that question. Or they'd make up some bullshit excuse like, well, maybe he was the only one littering. The only drunken high school student who littered? Sure. My brother was officially pronounced dead on January 12th, 2012. His cause of death was listed as probable drowning, the only theory which seemed reasonable. The area where Mark was last seen had a lot of deep pools of water connected to the Oconee River. Given his level of inebriation at the time, it was easy to assume he'd simply fallen into one such pool mark, never learned how to swim, and then his body was later washed out to sea via the river, which runs from the Okagobi Swamp to the Gulf of Mexico. Even though I didn't believe the Swamp Rex theory like Mark before me, I'd come to a realization that the monsters were always a hoax or a case of mistaken identity. I still couldn't quite live with the drowning explanation. I needed something more. Another part of my job was something called roving, where I walked the trails and boardwalks of the Okagobi National Park, talking to visitors and looking for anything suspect. I did this a few times a week. I didn't carry a firearm. 
That was for law enforcement LE Rangers only, not interp ones and definitely not someone doing a college internship. But I did have a high-powered radio that could contact an LE in case of emergencies. And I always wore a flat hat, something you've probably seen from many Smokey the Bear ads so hikers could spot me a mile away. Sometimes they asked about wildlife and the history of the swamp. Most of the time they came to complain about the lack of certain facilities, like trash cans. I roved the wilderness of the Okagobi Swamp for one reason. I was determined to find something, anything. Any remnant of my brother's existence. Even if it was just the stupid charm bracelet I'd given him the day he disappeared. I knew all the search parties before me had covered the same ground but there were still plenty of stories of someone finding clues in the exact same location people had searched years earlier. It was possible. It had to be possible. A few months into my job, I was roving the north boardwalk when I saw something out of the corner of my eye. A flash of movement. It looked like a lanky teenager. The figure dashed into the surrounding cypress trees, disappearing in an area that was usually flooded. I half expected the runaway to sink waist deep in mud, but this was late March and it hadn't rained in a month. The land was as dry as it would get, and the mysterious individual had moved expertly through it. I reached for my radio, planning to call in the incident. Someone's gone off the designated trail, I would have said. In most situations, this is something a ranger would handle, but something made me put the radio down. A lingering feeling. That kid. Was it a boy? He almost looked. Mark. I should have taken it as a warning sign. I wish I'd just radioed the LE Ranger. Instead, I stepped off the boardwalk and started into the woods. There was nothing in the area where the figure was headed. My NPS map just showed a blank spot on the northern edge of the swamp. Because of its extreme density and uninhabitable terrain, almost half of the Okagobi is uncharted. Most of its land is hidden beneath four feet of murky brown water and another five feet of black muck, too difficult to walk through for a detailed survey. I looked for the kid in the cypress trees ahead, but couldn't see any movement. I did see the occasional shoe print in the mud, however. It looked like a converse shoe. Definitely not something you'd want in such terrain. The intermittent tracks led deeper and deeper into the swamp. I came across one every 10 to 20 yards. At one point, I stopped to take a drink from my Nalgene bottle and was shocked to see a full two hours had passed. It was almost 5 p.m. Shit. I was supposed to be back at the park headquarters to start closing procedures 30 minutes ago. How was it already 5? It felt like I'd stepped off the boardwalk only moments before. I started to backtrack. I planned to let an LE know about the lost kid. But first, I needed an excuse for being so late. Was I helping a lost hiker find his way back to the trailhead? Did I have to clean up a bunch of trash on the boardwalk? I was about to radio headquarters when I felt my boots slip out from under me, and I tumbled down a small muddy hill, my body crashing through a dense thicket of palmetto bushes. Dazed, I struggled to my feet, wiping off as much dirt as I could. My green slacks and gray collared shirt had turned black from muck. My flat hat was crushed. My radio was cracked and unusable, and my cell phone was caked in mud. But as soon as I saw my surroundings, I forgot about everything else. I was inside a campsite, almost an acre in size. The place was astonishing. It had an old canvas tent, pitched beneath a sprawling live oak, a fire pit, a small garden, a compost station, a dugout latrine, even a plastic tarp for catching rainwater. A series of large ceramic jars stood by the rain catcher. They looked to be storing water. There was no one around. The tent was empty, but I could tell the site was still inhabited. Everything was well maintained and the fire pit had some recently burned coals in its center. Who could be living here, I wondered. Was it the boy I was chasing? Was he hiding in the bushes somewhere nearby, afraid of getting caught? No. Whoever had been living at the site had been there for years, perhaps even decades. The camp was surrounded by dense palmetto bushes and a makeshift wall of driftwood. 
It was so well camouflaged that I realized I had already walked past it before falling down the hill. Hello, I said tentatively. There was no response. Cicadas droned from the nearby trees. I was about to leave when something along the far edge of camp caught my attention. It appeared to be a crude statue carved out of an old tree trunk and decorated with various objects. As I approached, its details came into focus. The statue depicted a humanoid figure with an alligator's head and a long, muscular tail, clearly meant to be the Swamp Rex. There were various objects around it. Some had been laid at the creature's feet. A moldy tennis shoe, a broken compass, part of a child's lunchbox. Others were draped over its body. A baseball cap, a canteen, a golden necklace bearing a cross. They were arrayed in a specific pattern, as if the statue was some kind of a shrine. I crept closer, almost mesmerized by the mysterious display, and that's when I saw it. A bracelet made of Lego blocks, hanging around the statue's left wrist. My breath stopped. All noise faded. I reached out and grabbed the bracelet. The letters were faint, but still legible. M-O-O-K-I-E. This was the very bracelet I'd given my older brother the day he disappeared. My skin felt prickly with fear and worry. I put the bracelet in my vest pocket, then turned around, looking in all directions. Mark. There was no response. The campsite was perfectly still. My eyes scanned the tent, the garden, the compost heap, the latrine, the male figure, hidden in shadow, standing at the edge of the woods. Motionless, I gasped. How long had he been there? It was too dark to make out the man's features. Could it be... Mark? Somehow, I already knew the answer. There was a loud his. Then, very slowly, the figure stepped into the light. A six-foot-tall man, mid to late fifties, with a muscular frame and scraggly gray hair. A hermit. His wiry body was covered in dirt, mud, and bug bites. And he was completely naked. The hermit stared at me with bloodshot eyes, his expression unreadable. Angry? Scared? Confused? My stomach wrenched with fear. Every alarm bell in my brain was ringing simultaneously. S. So sorry, sorry, I stammered, backing away with my hands up. I didn't mean to. I can leave. The hermit opened his cracked lips to reveal rotten, yellowed teeth. He hissed, producing a noise so low and resonant, it sounded like a giant snake. I jumped back, falling on my behind at the foot of the shrine. No, please. But the hermit didn't attack. Instead, he grabbed something from within the tent. Something big. It looked like a pile of clothes. When he brought it out, I nearly screamed. It was a suit made of thick reptilian skin. The hermit had stitched together pieces of alligator hide to form a Swamp Rex costume. It had long sleeves that ended in clawed gloves, a hood made from a gator skull, webbed feet, even a tail. The monster suit was ugly as sin, but also intricate, terrifying, mesmerizing. The hermit started to put it on. His movements were slow and deliberate, like this was all part of some sort of ritual. What, what are you? I crawled backwards, keeping my eyes on him the whole time. My fingers brushed against a piece of driftwood, a potential weapon. The hermit stepped forward, wearing his swamp wreck suit. He looked like a mutant from the bowels of hell. The man hissed again, his voice amplified by the gator skull. It was louder, more guttural. I grabbed hold of the driftwood piece and stood up. The branch was small, but solid like a billy club. I raised it up defensively, and Mark's bracelet fell from my vest pocket. The hermit stared at the bracelet and hissed again. He took a step back. Cautiously, I picked up the bracelet with my free hand and held it out so the hermit could see it more clearly. It hung loosely from my fingertips. Where? Where did you get this? No response. Do you know Mark Brooks? I asked, trying to sound a bit more confident. With his gloved hand, the hermit pointed to the ceramic jars standing beneath the rain catcher. The ones that held water. I don't understand. Can you, can you speak? The hermit didn't say anything. He walked over to the jars, his reptilian hands brushing across the top of each one until 
He tipped the last jar over. Crash. A gallon of slimy liquid poured out, along with a pile of big white sticks. No. Not sticks. Bones. Inside the jar was a complete human skeleton, its bones all mashed together. Oh F, I stammered. This was his answer. I was looking at Mark, spilled across the ground like some carnivore's leftovers. No, no, no. Hiss. The hermit raised his gloved hands. His eyes shined within the gator's skull. My whole body shook. Sweat poured down my face. This was it. The end. I had my answer, and I would pay the ultimate price for it. Until I saw him. The boy who had run from the boardwalk so many hours ago. The one I'd been following. It was Mark, still 18 years old and wearing the same faded jeans and long-sleeved shirt from the night he disappeared. He looked at me, then pointed at something lying against the tent. A shotgun. I threw the driftwood at the hermit as hard as I could, then sprinted for the tent. Five feet, three, two, one. I grabbed the weapon with shaky hands. There was just enough time to turn bang. Blood splattered my face. The blast threw the hermit backwards. His six-foot-tall body fell to the ground with a thud. It all happened so fast, I didn't even realize I'd pulled the trigger until afterwards. Smoke curled from the barrel of the shotgun. I let out a sharp cry that was half cough, half sob. The hermit lay motionless a few feet away. I pumped the shotgun a second time as I stepped towards him, fingers still on the trigger. He never got up. Afterwards, I looked all over camp for my Mark's ghost, calling out his name. But aside from that split-second moment before the attack, I never saw my brother again. To this day, I wonder if I ever saw him at all. Perhaps it was all nerves. Perhaps my brother was just a manifestation of the my intense fear upon meeting the real Swamp Rex. Looking back, I'm struck by how similar the Hermit's campsite was to the Swiss Family Robinson-style home mark, and I had imagined we'd live in when we were little. Aside from the obscene shrine and jars, of course, the police cordoned off the entire site the next day. Aside from Mark, they found the remains of 12 other people, even wealthy land developer Jerry Flagler. News vans came from all over. Word of the Swamp Rex's discovery spread internationally. Most importantly, our family finally had a proper burial for my brother that provided some much-needed closure. My parents and I wept for weeks on end. So far, the police have not been able to identify the hermit, even after analyzing dental records, completing a DNA profile and sending his picture to various news outlets. There have been numerous theories, of course. Some said the hermit was Michael Jenkins, an escaped mental patient who vanished from a South Florida asylum 40 years ago, though the photos didn't bear much resemblance. Others claimed various serial killers who had never been caught like the Zodiac. Some even believed the hermit was planted by the federal government to cover up the existence of the real creature. But no one came forward with any solid evidence. Nothing verifiable. The hermit has remained as mysterious as the swamp creature he had pretended to be for so many years. I've since moved clear across the country. I currently reside in the vast metropolis of Los Angeles. I don't go hiking anymore. I never go camping. I hardly ever even leave the house. But each night I dream. I dream that I'm still deep in that swamp, alone in my cold, reptilian skin. I am the hermit. And the thing that worries me the most... I enjoy it. I could not sleep. It was 1.41 am. I turned over to try to sleep. The next thing my body went dead, with no movement, nothing. There was no life in my body. My feet floated up and my whole body followed. I was floating upward. I could move my eyes. There was black all around me except for the lights floating past me. I could look from left to right. I looked straight up. There was a triangle-shaped object ahead of me. There were lights all under the object. I then blacked out. The next thing I know I woke up in a dark room. They placed me on a table. All of a sudden my whole body started vibrating from head to toe. I would make a groaning sound ever so often. I could not see them, but I know they were there. 
When I was placed back in my bed, I was waking up, feeling like I had been unconscious. The next day I was very tired. The whole week I was tired. When I woke up the next morning the thought of what had happened that night did not come to mind. I got in the shower and started praying the incident came back to me. It was so strong that it stopped my prayers. I was speechless. When they take you, you have no control. Sometimes you can see what is going on and sometimes you can't. Ever since I can remember I have been abducted many times before. They are just blocked out. Only in these last dozen years, I can remember some things about the abductions. I cannot remember the day or time, but this abduction was the one that changed me forever. This happened in 2014. I was watching television, and the next second the power went off all over the house. My TV has to reboot so I didn't want to wait and I just turned it off. The next thing I know I was floating out of my room. When they were taking me it was well lit. I was lying on a table, and they were standing on either side of me. There seemed to be one on the right side of my head as I was floating out from where they had taken me. I woke up in my bed, I still couldn't move my body, but I could move my head. I looked towards my bedroom door and saw the shadow of an alien. The head was large, the arms were long and thin, the hands were thin with long, thin fingers. I yelled out because I thought it was my son. I kept calling his name and no one answered. When I first yelled out the alien stood still, he did not move. I started to get frustrated because I thought it was my son and I wasn't getting an answer. The next minute there was a flash of light coming from where the being was standing and he was gone. I got up and went to my son's room and he was asleep. It wasn't him who cast that shadow. The next morning I was on the road in front of my job. There was a sheriff's car parked between two buses. I drove on into the parking lot and was backing up to park. There was only one car parked on the left of me. I started texting my daughter a message. I looked up there were two joggers running right next to my car. They ran so close they could have hit my car. They ran together as if they were sewn together. I could not see their faces. I never saw them coming or going. It hasn't happened since. It was kind of strange for that to happen. After my abduction, I have an allergic reaction to something they used on me. I have had posterior bleeding and severe pain in my female organs. The pain is so severe I can't walk and it travels from there to my rear. I have seen apparitions. I have seen dark figures in my room. I have had ear ringing when certain aircraft fly over. I see flashes of light at night when I'm out. I have learned to ignore them. I can be driving and don't know how I got from point A to B. My daughter would hear strange noises coming from my room like operating room sounds. My TV would turn itself off sometimes. It's been nine years and I still suffer the horrific effects of that one abduction. I live in Fayetteville, North Carolina. This abduction occurred in January 2014. Honestly, I never got a conclusive identity on whatever it was I saw, so sharing it actually might help with that. This was about a year old, late August 2022, and I was fishing on Cold Lake, right on the border between Alberta and Saskatchewan. I had one of my most productive fishing days ever there, and kept a few walleye to cook for dinner, since I bought the tags for them. I tented on the north end of the lake, east of the North Bay cabin, since I don't really like campgrounds much. It was probably about 5-6 p.m. when I set up camp and got the fire going. I do remember I still fished from the bank for an hour or so until I eventually got dinner going. During that period is when I remember first hearing a lot more noises out of the tree line than before, not anything out of the ordinary, mostly just birds and the occasional squirrel. Eventually I started to get the feeling of something watching me, which actually got me a bit more worried than what I'd usually be as my first thought, albeit not the most rational one, was a cougar. I know what it feels like to be watched by one, it's uncomfortable to say the absolute least, and a terrifyingly surreal experience at worst. Each time I look back, there wasn't anything watching me that I saw. Eventually I lost interest and began supper, which is when the sounds of the forest largely stopped. Things felt cold dead. 
the forest felt dead. Now even more on guard about a possible cougar or bear, I moved away from the tree line and closer to the shore, as there was a bit of flat ground forming, almost like a beach. I didn't have a firearm at the time, but I did have a can of bear spray on my chest, which moved to my hand. There still wasn't anything visible through the tree line, but the faint sound of what could be footsteps cut through the silence of the forest. In all reality, it was less footsteps and more the sound of an animal moving through the brush that was heard. Weirdly enough, it sort of relaxed me, as a cougar likely wouldn't be so carelessly loud, at least it did for a moment. Aware that I was rather vulnerable in my position, I did begin backing up my stuff. Thankfully, my tent wasn't set up yet back in my bag and got near the kayak. What I saw when I looked back up at the tree line, not even 20 feet in front of me, however, was likely the most terrifying, yet uniquely beautiful moment of my life. Standing upright, half behind a tree, was a tall, maybe seven feet, dark humanoid thing. Vaguely like a Sasquatch, but much thinner, closer to the proportions of a human covered in reddish-brown hair or fur. All I could see was its body above the waist, though its arms seemed to extend further down. I couldn't make out much features, though the eyes appeared vaguely yellowish. Oddly enough. After the initial shock wore off, it didn't seem threatening, if anything I want to say it was. Curious. What I'm about to say next defies all common logic, all human reason. But as someone standing face to face with what could have been death itself, I raised my arm in the air. The best way I could describe this scene is if anybody has ever watched the fantastic Mr. Fox, the scene at the end with the wolf. That's the closest thing I could compare it to. The creature didn't come any closer, nor did it make a sound, but instead oddly attempted to mimic me, raising its long, thin arm in the air before setting it back down and walking back into the tree line. What I saw that day, the creature I witnessed, led me to reevaluate my opinions towards these animals, that they weren't just animals. These are intelligent creatures, and the time it took to kayak back to civilization immediately afterwards, and the time since then, has only reaffirmed my belief in that. Of all the encounters people have had with what could be a Sasquatch, I'm glad mine became almost a positive memory. Whatever I saw that day left an impression on me, human, Sasquatch, whatever. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.